Hi, everybody. Welcome to the program. It's the Jeff Gersman Show. My name is Jeff Gersman. I'll be hosting the program this week. Thank you for having me. Thank you for, thank you for inviting me into your phones. Uh, whether those are headphones or telephones, I suppose it works either way. If you're watching on a television, then I guess it doesn't work. Uh, but here we are. It's the middle of November. Hey, uh, Thanksgiving is next week. Thanksgiving is next week. I, I don't. Time is frightening. It's terrifying. Um, and here we are. Uh, Black Friday is right around. Get ready to strap in for those Black Friday deals. We've got all the latest deals here. Click here for the latest deals. I'm getting. I'm now getting emails. Uh to like my public facing like the the address on my YouTube account that is like new data reveals the best game releases to get this Black Friday Call of Duty crowned top what under what metric I don't know what okay I guess by people searching for it okay maybe that makes sense I don't know um not a lot of gift guide outreach but I think that's because you know people real you know the people that are sending those emails typically know what's going on they don't, they don't I, i've got a few of those i got one that was like i got one from sega that was like here's the products basically like companies just send out a list of like here's everything we put out this year if you want to consider it for a gift guide that'd be cool so it's it's like a really weird um <laughs> it's, a, it's a really you know it's always a weird email um and they're like sonic superstars what if you put that in a what if you put that in a gift guide? I, like for people that I don't like, like who am I giving gifts to in this, in this uh, scenario here? Who is getting the gifts? Is it someone like, hey, do you hate everyone in your life? Here's a copy of uh, Sonic Superstars. I'm sorry. Uh, Game Awards nominated Sonic Superstars. Yeah. We'll talk about the Game Awards nominees. We'll talk about... Um, I don't know. Some other stuff when we get to the news here. I have been, gosh, um, things are starting to even out a little bit over here. We're, you know, fingers crossed um, that uh, we're kind of on the other side of illness, at least here for a little bit. Um, but uh, but you know, things are things are evening out. My my daughter is in a thing. She's in a play. We had to memorize, my wife did most of the work, but uh, we had to help her memorize some lines for a play. And she picked it right up. She's really good at memorizing stuff in a way that I feel like I never was, but she nailed it. She's already, she's already got it down. Um, I think she's going to be part of a group of people shouting lines. I should really, I, I'll, maybe I'll take a picture of the script for this thing. And I, I was surprised. It's about Thanksgiving. And it's like... If you know, it opens with a uh, king saying, "If you don't go to our church, you're going to go to jail," and them saying no, and then uh, fleeing, and then uh, yeah, it's yeah, I don't know. It's it's very it was very interesting. I, I'm I cannot wait to see it. I am super excited to go. That's Wednesday morning, so no stream on Wednesday morning because uh, I'm gonna go see this play. I have to go. I'm, I'm going to go check this out. I cannot wait to see it. Um, and uh, yeah, I, yeah, I'm, I'm excited. My daughter's in a play. I'm going to a school play. It's crazy. Crazy. Again, time. It's weird. Um, as for video, you know, Hey, I've been playing Puzmo for the past. Uh, well, I started yesterday. That's Puzmo.com. It's uh, Zach Gage and some collaborators. You may know some of the games like Type Shift uh, or Spell Tower have both been, uh, you know, when they came out on phones, were, were well regarded uh, standalone products. And, um, and Puzmo is it's basically a collection of puzzles of that ilk. You can play a game called Really Bad Chess that is, uh, you know, taking chess rules and doing some some other stuff. And um, it is it is basically there. They have a, a literal manifesto. Um, 
and they are billing it as like, Hey, we wanted to redesign the, you know, the newspaper like puzzle page, you know? So they've got a crossword puzzle in there with a hint system to kind of make it a little more palatable to the average person that doesn't want to spend all day being a, a crossword puzzle weirdo. Um, and then they score you based on how you do. So if you take more hints, you don't get as many points or, or whatever, but you know, Hey, um, it's an interesting setup. Uh, you can do it for free and they'll have daily puzzles and, and everything. And then they have a subscription aspect to it where you can give them money every year or they're currently selling lifetime subscriptions. I ended up going with the lifetime subscription um, because it was cheaper in the long run. <laughs> uh, assuming I do puzzles for two years. We'll see. Um... And I thought that this whole thing was like an independent operation and everything. And I was like, wow, what a cool, you know, it's like the next step in, you know, because his type shift came out on, on phone spell tower. I believe there's a type do they do. They did a game. They did really good. Uh, good Sudoku. That's not part of this yet, but, um, but Zach age, uh, has, has done a handful of, of quality puzzles. Uh, and put them out on phones and, and everything else. So uh, now the, bringing all of this together under one roof on a website seems like a really smart idea. It's backed by Hearst, like Hearst, like the newspaper people. <laughs> I was like, oh, wait, fuck. Like it was this, you know, the page doesn't, the page is like, hey man, this is from Puzmo Inc. And then we got our manifesto about how this can be better. And then you click like, who works here? And like at the bottom, it's like, here's partnerships over at Hearst. Here's this over. And you're like, oh. Okay, yeah, right. You're a literal newspaper. It's a literal newspaper doing this. It's, uh, yes, someone watched Wordle happen and said, what can we do in that vein that is kind of taking it to the next level? And I think Puzmo is it. I, Puzmo is cool. It, it's very early. I think a lot of the social stuff is funky, and um, they are not just letting anyone in. It's this weird process where they put up, like, what, 500 keys a day? Like, basically, you go to the website in the morning or whenever the puzzles refresh, and, um, and you can, uh, uh, you know, if, if you complete that day's free puzzle or, or the, the front facing puzzle, then you will get a key. You will be able to join. But what they want to do is you do that. And, and I got a, a code from, um, I believe Remy on the discord sent me that, um, and, uh, it lets you skip the line and, and everything. But what they do is they want to mail you a postcard with a puzzle on it, which is quaint and fun. Uh, but apparently their mailing process is super broken right now. So, uh, so I never got my postcard or I will someday, I assume. But after a week you get an email saying, Hey, we noticed you haven't signed up for an account yet. We know our process is broken. Uh, so here's a PDF that you can, is a PDF version of the of the puzzle so you can get in and they've got social features. Like you can join teams and clubs and, and whatever else, but like the, you, I could not find a way after I joined a team, I could not find a way to get back to the team page without clicking on my invite again, which is weird. But, um, anyway, it's a, it's a fascinating service with a handful of different puzzle types and they, they're trying experimental new puzzles. And so I think that they are, they, they have created a good, like proving ground for new types of puzzles and they have a, you know, a good track record of fun puzzles that they have created over the past handful of years here to, to a point where like this feels good. Um, at, in terms of like, Oh yeah. Like, uh, you know, they'll have like daily puzzles of these kind of cool varieties type shift and, and things that I already like their crossword puzzle seems pretty good as someone who's not like a big crossword puzzle fan, I was like, Oh, this is actually better than, yeah. Okay. I, I actually do like this. Um, and then some experimental puzzles that they're messing with that will maybe get worked into the lineup and maybe won't, I don't know. It, it's uh, it's really, um, interesting. And then when you take it that step further of like, Oh, the, the games page, the, the puzzles page in the newspaper and how can we do, you know, how can we do that better and, and everything? I think it's kind of cool. I think it's it's a little clunky on phones. Um, it seems like it is somewhat designed for phones, but it just, I don't know, it, it seems a little awkward there. So um, so I've been playing it on desktop in a, in a, in a browser and, and that's been, that's been fine. Um, so yeah, I don't know, Puzmo.com if you want to if you want to look into it, uh, and, uh, yeah, it is still, it is still early. There's a lot of missing navigation stuff, I think in, in my experience, but, uh, but yeah, 
kind of cool. Um, I finished the uh, I, Call of Duty Modern Warfare Three. Is I don't, I think it is a, I, I do not think that this is a good game. I think that they made some interesting decisions that could have made for a good game that are undercut by other decisions that they made. Um, I think it is one of the worst one of these that they have made. Um, this is the, it's, it's Black Ops 4 for a new generation. I am shocked by it i guess i would say i, I don't know well it, it's i don't know I, I the process right like the, this annual franchise and uh and everything you start to wonder like is this just a scenario where everything is wound so tight on this annual franchise that the minute one thing goes wrong the entire thing spirals apart and then you're left with like well we still have to put a game out this year so cobble together what you can I, like that's how black ops 4 felt at the time that they apparently had some crazy ambitious campaign and they're like oh none of this works we have to scrap all of this and we've gone too far to now pivot it into something else like this seems well i, I don't know like i'm, I'm trying to leave out the, the there is reporting based you know saying hey they only had a year and a half instead of the other time you know the the three-year cycle that some games have been on and and so in that rush cycle that that, that they did what they could and blah 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 and and, and so I'm, I'm trying to just kind of look at the game as it is instead of just like falling back to the, the reporting because i think when you look at the game you just see trouble or you see Trouble mixed with choices that I don't think worked out for them. And I'm sure some people will disagree, but like, okay, so the campaign, I think is a drag. I think universally it's been, it's, you know, the, the, a lot of, I, I've, I've not seen a lot of people say what a great campaign. You know, it, it's, it seems pretty universally panned. Uh, I think it is one of the worst campaigns they have ever done. Um, I would probably say Vanguard is worse. Um, in terms of it just being like a Vanguard's just supremely boring. These, this game made choices that I think don't work. You know, you're, you're going to net out differently depending on who you are. Um, with modern warfare three, they go for this like open zone, this open campaign mission, open combat mission where they kind of try to work in the, uh, mechanics of war zone into the proceedings and uh, it's awkward. I don't think it fits very well. I think that a lot of the... We talked some about a lot of this last week. Um, the in-game dialogue that is pushing you in the direction uh, of the objective talks too much and is just like, you got to get those missiles. You got to get over there, get those missiles. You got to get you keep running in that direction. Like trying to remind you that there's an objective and it's just... it's That part is shitty. It's shitty. Um, and they, they should adjust the frequency of dialogue on that. That's something that's fixable. It's, it's not end of the world type stuff. Um, so I, I had a problem pre-release where there was a bug in a mission about halfway through, uh, where when you would load it up, it would just freeze up. And, uh, I was stuck for a while. Uh, a couple days ago I was able to, they, they fixed it. And so I had to start the mission over again. They wiped my mid mission save at one point, but it was still broken. And so when I manually decided to restart that mission a couple days ago, I was, I was able to get through it and then finish the rest of the campaign. Um, nothing happens in this game. Nothing. Like, this is supposed to be the game of, like, hey, Makarov is here, and Makarov's the... He, this is the reboot version of the guy that did no Russian, so you know it's going to be heavy shit. And they squander all of it. They really... I think their attempts to have heavy shit in the game backfire greatly in ways that you're just like, this is this, none of this lands. Um, instead they paint Makarov as just this like aimless boogeyman of just like, Oh, you should, you should watch out for me. Not for you. Watch for yourself. Not for me, comrade. You know, just, he's just this talk in circles, fucking dumbass that, um, that when they, you know, in, in the mission where they do kind of have a bit of dialogue back and forth, which is the one that crashed on me the, the most, it's like a flashback mission or, or whatever. Um, 
it doesn't make a lot of sense why he's there. They they try to reveal him like it's a big deal, but if you don't remember those original games, um, none of it lands. I, I I don't think any of that lands at all. Um, I but yeah, I think their attempts to kind of push people's buttons and be like, look at this heavy stuff. Look at these innocent humans. You know, these innocent lives being squandered. This is this is bigger than just combat between soldiers. You know, like, fuck you. Like it's none of that. Um, none of that works. I think I, I talked a little bit about last week, but I think when you set that game against the current events that are happening around it, which is not necessarily a fault of the game, they walked into some of it. Um, it comes across extra bad. Uh, I think it's pretty crappy. Um, but basically nothing happens in a way that you're like, oh, are you going to make another, you're, you're going to make another one of these? Because like it ends with like, this is not the end of a, a trilogy. This is not like, and that's what happened. And now you, we got the bad guys. Instead, it's like, hey, there were some bad guys in the previous game that kind of get walked back into the fold for no reason. Like, you know, for uh, Fast and the Furious gets uh, gets a lot of shit for you know, letting Jason Statham and, 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 and all these other characters kind of walk back in and be like, we're friends now. This does that. Like without even there's like half a line of dialogue about why this character is allowed within a hundred meters of, you know, Sergeant price and the crew and, and, and whatever else. Right. It, it, it's, it's really shoddy. Um, they attempt to bring it back around in a like post credit kind of mid credit sequence. They go like, oh, well, here's, here's someone's getting theirs. So this uh, something we're going to, we're tying up one loose end here. And oh, what does that mean? Like it, it's, it's really shitty. Um, it's a game where you are chasing after a bad guy who is always one step ahead of you. And then at the end of the game, the bad guy is still one step ahead of you. And you're like, okay. What did we accomplish? I guess, you know, it, it feels like a fucking G.I. Joe episode of just like, well, Cobra lives to fight another day, I guess. Like, we stopped them from blowing up something. I mean, they blew up some stuff. They killed some people, but we stopped them from killing other ones. So that's good, right? You're like, okay, yeah. And then tomorrow he does it all over again because he's an evil ultra nationalist. You know, it's just fucked. Um, it's so aimless. It's so pointless. And it's the, the ending is a borderline slap in the face for like, Hey, did you manage to get invested in these characters in modern warfare two? Here's, we're going to squander all that goodwill over the course of this campaign. And then at the end of it, there's no payoff. Fuck you. See you next year. It's really nuts. Um, but whatever, that's the campaign. Who cares? Like at the end of the day, the campaign's the campaign. Most people don't even play it. Um, and and so, uh, you know, whatever. Um, I think the multiplayer. I think the competitive multiplayer turned out bad. And this is this is actually shocking to me in a way because I the pitch made sense and the beta felt good. The, in the beta, you're like, oh, well, this all this sliding around, like they, they changed the movement to make it a little more aggressive, to make it, I, I described it as like, you know, Street Fighter 2 to Street Fighter 2 Turbo. It's like, here's, it's a little bit faster. You're moving a little bit faster. You're, you're, you're mantling a little bit faster. You're just, you're scaring around and, and kind of, you know, you're, you're able to move a little bit more crazily, I guess, than you could in, in the previous year's game. Um, and I think that's fun in standard Call of Duty. What has become standard Call of Duty maps? Now, for this year's game, their big pitch on the multiplayer is we are remastering and remaking all of the maps from the original Modern Warfare 2. All that classic video game from 2009 that you love. And I was like, shit, man. Yeah. I, I played probably hundreds of hours of that game. Like, yeah. Okay. Like I would play on those maps again. Great. I think that these maps do not work well with the movement mechanics. Generally speaking, I think that these maps come from an era of call of duty that is gone for a reason. 
And I think that these maps are actually kind of bad in the modern context of what Call of Duty is now. Because um, you can clamber around, climb up on stuff, and, and do all these things that you couldn't do back then, really. Um, but the real problem I am having with the game is from a pacing standpoint, from an encounter range standpoint, so many of these maps have really long sight lines, um, a lot of very featureless terrain of just like, oh, well, I don't know. There's a guy on a rooftop with a fucking sniper rifle crouched three quarters of the way across the map and there's an empty field in front of him. So don't go that way. Uh, and it's, you know, you don't hear the complaints about like, oh, these fucking campers and snipers and everything. You don't really hear those complaints anymore about Call of Duty because they bred that out of the maps. They don't make maps like that anymore. Like Call of Duty moved in a direction. Um, and then, you know, they added the much larger, like 40 on 40, 64 on 64 stuff. And all that stuff kind of comes back into play. Um, but like this brings it all back in a way that's like, oh, okay, well, I guess I have to spend this entire match now flanking these snipers because they've got five spots here around this mansion that they're on this rooftop, this rooftop, and they're going to keep getting back up on those rooftops over and over again. And so we've just got to get around them and shoot them in the back or throw a grenade up there or someone's got to distract them by dying in front of them over and over again while I run around the left side and shoot them in the side over and over again. It's not fun. It feels like, you know, like it's, um, it is the old call of duty in, in that way. And that's gone for a reason. And so to have it come back in this glaring fashion is no fucking fun. And then you compound that by not having the maps from the previous game be playable here anymore. You can go launch the Modern Warfare 2 multiplayer and go play in, in that section or, or whatever. But they're like, hey, man, we got all these new guns and you can slide and do all this cool shit. And you're like, oh, that's fun. I want to do that. And they're like, all right, cool. Do it in this fucking open snow field. You're like, fuck this. I don't want to fucking do that. It's, it's, um, it just feels like this insane tactical error of just like, unless they deliberately wanted to like bring marksman rifles and sniper rifles back into Vogue or something. Like I'm just looking at it going like, I don't know why. Like I, I feel done with the game. I, I will probably chip away at it for a little while longer or something, but like, I think they, I think it's a huge mistake. I think like those maps don't do not work in 2023. They might work as part of a larger game with a wider variety of maps, but having a game, but, but pulling these maps out of 2009 and they've made changes and done some things, but like, if anything, you're the easy ability you have to get on rooftops, like even easier than ever, um, just kind of leads to more of this and it's bizarre. It doesn't feel like current call of duty and maybe some people will like that better, but I think it is. So, so much worse, so much worse. Um, it's like, it, it, and that's the part that's shocking to me. It's like, I kept playing it going like, what's there's something wrong with this. There's something wrong with this game. It doesn't like, I, I don't, I don't get what the, what's the problem. And it, it finally dawned on me last night as I was like st staring at fucking scope glint for an entire match and just going, dude, this sucks. This fucking sucks. This is a bad time I'm having here. Um, and it all clicked. And I was like, that's why, that's the problem. It's these stupid fucking maps. They don't work in this day and age. And that's all they have are maps from that era. It's really bizarre. Um, so that's, that's modern warfare. There's also a zombie mode. So they, they took last year's DMZ mode. If you're not familiar with last year's game, if you're not familiar with kind of where, uh, where call of duty is at, um, they had a mode last year called DMZ. You form a three person team. You parachute in. There's missions you can complete in the open world. There's a bunch of AI there to fuck you up, as well as other players. And so you'd have objectives like, oh, well, we want to get stuff and leave. It's kind of an extraction-based mode. People have tried to compare it to Escape from Tarkov. Um, though it is not as fucking crazy as that. Um, 
And so if you die, you drop all your stuff. And then you, next time you decide to go into the zone, you don't have any of your gear anymore. So there's, it's that, that process of go in, collect a cool vest, complete a few missions and then extract so we can have the gear for next time or, or whatever. Um, that's what DMZ was. And they've, that's what this new zombies mode is also. So it's, it is, they have taken the DMZ style mechanics and they've put zombies in it. And, you know, some of the goofy shit that goes into zombies, like healing auras. And I thought I saw a screenshot of a laser gun, because why not? Um, there are also, you know, non-zombie mercenaries in there and other, other human teams as well that will show up to jack you uh, up. Not off, just up. Uh, and... You have to complete your missions and get out and, and whatever else. And so it's like, here's here's DMZ, but worse. I, d I don't think that this is going to satisfy people who liked DMZ. And I don't think it's going to satisfy people who liked the zombies mode in previous games because those were always this very deliberate round based, like, you know, zombies became a very specific thing. And I might say it is maybe a little too specific and I get why they would want to try to make changes. But to try to just cram zombies into the DMZ mode, um, doesn't feel good. And and all of this, I think, comes together in a way to where you start to think, like, yeah, gosh, this game really feels rushed. It feels like something that they crammed out, and you start to understand why. You know, some of the reporting was like, oh, well, yeah, this was originally going to be DLC for the previous year's game. And that's the, the one of the kind of fucked things about it is if this was something that was bolted onto last year's game and all of last year's stuff was still there, this would be like, forget the pricing. Like, you know, that's a separate conversation, but if they were to take this content and insert it into modern warfare two and say, here's new maps, you still have the old maps, but here's new maps and here's new guns. And then here's a zombies mode, a zombies variant of DMZ. And you know, like, all of this would make a lot more sense and it would be a lot more palatable. Instead, some of it is there. The cosmetic stuff is carry forward and, and they, they bring some of those things into the new game, um, but not the maps, not the other modes. And so you're left with like, here's all this stuff that feels like add-on content without the chunk of base content there to help balance it all out and it's as a result I, I think it's bad it doesn't feel like a complete product and you start to see like oh this feels rushed this feels bad did, did they did, you know what what the hell happened here um and and so on and so forth <laughs> so there's a statement that sledgehammer games the, the 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 lead developer i guess on this year's call of duty game um, posted something from the head of studio, Aaron Hallen, and I'm just going to read what he wrote here. We're incredibly proud of Modern Warfare 3, both the full game... Okay, you know what? Before I get into this, just to, to kind of end the, the thought on the carry forward content of guns and characters and everything else. They bring all the characters and skins and everything into this year's game. So if you bought Snoop Dogg, if you unlocked a cool skin or you bought a skin, or you bought a thing that came with a gun skin, whatever. Character skins, gun skins, um, gun charms, the little dangly bits that hang off the gun, all the cosmetic shit. The vast majority of that comes into the game. So on top of everything feeling like, oh, it's like kind of, I'm having trouble like swallowing this as a brand new game, it doesn't feel right. It is also filled with all of the same characters and weapons and skins and everything from last year's game. And so that means you hear all of the same call out voice dialogue that you heard last year. So all of the stuff that would, would help contribute to it feeling new and feeling fresh. Instead, you've got the, the Irish guy saying the same, I took epoxy shot thing that, you know, uh, that he said last year. And uh, I'm on your six. Like, like all of those same voice call outs are just here. And so it's this weird thing where carry forward is the right move, right? Because if you bought a Snoop, if you bought a Snoop Dogg, if you bought Nicki Minaj, you want to continue having access to Nicki Minaj. 
it would be shitty of them to lock you out of it arbitrarily or, or whatever. But instead, it gives you even less incentive to focus on the new shit because you've got a year of old shit. It's like, hey man, you're going to unlock new fun. And, and so all the skins you unlock for the new guns are all, all like ridiculous out of the gate because it's been a year of weird shit already. It's been a year of fucking animated weed skins and, and all of this other shit and all of that's still in the game. So they had to start from crazy. It had to start like, you know, you can at least go a couple of months here as like, we're serious and boots on the ground and uh, hoorah. And, and, and then suddenly Skeletor is in the game nine months later. But when Skeletor is in the game on day one, the whole thing just feels like a fucking farce. And that's a weird bind. I don't know what the right answer is there because I think locking people out of cosmetics after a year, especially when the game is fucking identical in a lot of major ways. Um, I, I think that that's a weird one. And uh, I think that a lot of the new characters they've added this year to, as like part of the base game are not great. Um, it's, 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 it's just bizarre. Like there's, there's a real rock and a hard place feel on that stuff of like, I don't, cause I, I can't sit here and tell you what I think the right answer is. Right. Because if they had just, you know, well, I think they're actually, you know what? I think the right answer would have been carry forward all of the cosmetics, the skins, the guns, the, you know, all of that stuff. If they had recorded new VO for the characters, if they had, which is, you know, maybe prohibitively expensive and, and whatever, but if they had new VO for existing characters, so when I see someone else playing as Snoop Dogg, he is saying something else to me. Not even the character that I am having, having that character, you know, having that character have new lines. That'd be nice. But it's all the other characters on your team that are yapping at you. If they had recorded new shit for that, that might have helped. It's probably not a realistic uh, ask given the breadth of fucking weird motherfuckers that they got in the, in the studio to record this stuff. But, um, but yeah, I, I think that, that that stuff is, is, is bad. Okay. Again, we'll go back to the stage the statement from Aaron Howland, the studio head of sledgehammer games. We're incredibly proud of modern warfare three, both the full game experience at launch and the upcoming year of content we have planned for the community on behalf of the extremely talented team across Sledgehammer Games and our partner studios with whom we've collaborated on development, this has been a labor of love to lead the first ever back-to-back -back sequel in Call of Duty. We cannot wait to see our community's reaction to all that the entire game has to offer across campaign, multiplayer, and zombies. From the start of development, we have all been laser-focused on creating the next groundbreaking Call of Duty game. Long before we wrapped up our previous game, we heard loud and clear from fans about the desire to stay and play together for longer within the same series. And that's what we delivered, the first true sequel in franchise history. It's also why we added features like Carry Forward for the first time to honor the investment our players have made in the Modern Warfare series. And this is, the, this is maybe the relevant bit here at the end. We're proud to be the team to lead the way on Modern Warfare 3. We have worked hard to deliver on this vision, which has been years in the making. Anything said to the contrary is simply not true. This is our game and we cannot to play it, wait to play it online with all of you. So basically denying the rumors that like this started as DLC and that they only had a year and a half on it uh, and so on and so forth. That's from Aaron Howland, the studio head at Sledgehammer Games. I... I don't... Um, so they... They had an out as a studio that they uh, could have just not said any of this. And, um, and then there would be some ambiguity around it and people would just blame Activision. Ultimately people would go, Oh, that Bobby Kotick. Instead he's saying like, I know you've heard reports out there that uh, this game was started as a DLC. Nope. This was our vision all along. This is the game we wanted to make like, okay, then it's just bad. I like, okay. Like you've talked yourself into a corner where now it's just that the game is bad. It's not like, Oh, and yeah. And, and we were under the gun and we had, you know, it was tough development and all this other stuff. And, um, but you know, Hey, he's a studio head. You got to own it. You got to own the work of your team. You gotta, you gotta take that shit on the chin. You know, that's leadership, right? Um, 
this is uh yeah and then so this is on twitter because now there's like one of those twitter community messages under it that says readers added context they thought thought people might want to know more than a dozen call of duty devs said that modern warfare 3 was originally developed as an expansion to modern warfare 2 and not a premium standalone title staff felt betrayed by uh because they were promised they wouldn't have to go through another shortened timeline after call of duty vanguard so um and then a link to a bloomberg article about that that topic um yeah i don't know man i i'm uh I, you know we'll see what they add to the game and uh they they have been very ambiguous around maps from the previous year's game because like the maps from the previous year's game are really hard because you i would sit here and go like we'll just put all the maps from last year's game in but they still want to sell you copies of last year's game so if they dumped all the multiplayer maps from modern warfare 2 in onto this game for everyone for free uh then who would go spend 70 dollars on a copy of modern warfare 2 um, and if they did it, so, oh, if you own both games, then you'll be in a different multiplayer hop, then you're splitting the player base again. And that's why we stopped selling map packs in the first place as a people, as a society. That's why we stopped. Uh, that's why they don't do that anymore is because when they were selling maps, you ended up in situations where like, oh, I bought the maps, but my friend didn't, and this didn't work. And oh, there's like, no one bought the maps this year. So when I go try to play in this playlist that includes the new maps, the wait times are like 20 minutes or, you know, or whatever it is. Um, it's why they're smart to make the maps free, make the maps free and sell cosmetics. Like that's, that's, um, fine. That's fine. I bought Nicki Minaj. I bought Snoop doggy dog. I'm not above buying a skin here and there. Um, but in this specific situation where I think a big thing that would go a long way to helping fix the problems that the game has is to just dump the modern warfare two maps into it. Um, that would at least be a good stop gap. They, they kind of can't because they would still really love it if, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, they're going to put a playlist, uh, block giant says they're adding a playlist with previous games maps, but only three of them. And then they'll add more maps to it throughout the year. So yeah, they, they did, they did kind of imply that they might do something like this. So maybe they'll get there. Um, they also had to turn off a handful of maps because they had bad spawn points and they're like, we're taking these maps out of these rotations and ah, cause it's broken it's bad. So, um, it's rough, man. I, uh, this, this game is, uh, this game's a disappointment for a handful of reasons. I, I think, you know, if I had to just sum it up, it's that it's, um, they wrote Modern Warfare 3 on the box. And while I think that Modern Warfare 3 was not a very good game the first time around, so maybe this is fitting with the trend. Um, this was the reboot franchise that was actually really great. This was the reboot franchise that I think in some ways saved Call of Duty. I think that Modern Warfare, the the first Modern Warfare reboot there from a few years ago is an incredible game. Um, I think that Modern Warfare 2 was also very good. I think that they did a lot of smart things there and they had some a couple of rough games in between those two games. Your Black Ops Cold War and uh, I guess Vanguard is in, in, in the middle of that there somewhere too, right? Um, some rough stuff and then Modern Warfare 2 got it back on track and you're like, oh, I guess Infinity Ward makes the good ones again. That's fun. Um, I guess Modern Warfare 3 is the sub-franchise to watch for and, and not anymore. Um, Because Modern Warfare 3 is, is an extreme disappointment. And now what? You gonna reboot it again? You gonna what? You know, like you kind of you. You spent that. You can't just. I mean, now what? Is it sounds like that they are um, going to Black Ops next year, and then Modern Warfare Four the year after that. So, I, uh, yeah, I, I this it's um, it's a shame. Because I, I I feel like the the franchise overall was was doing some good work. Again, I think Modern Warfare Two had become the sub franchise to watch because Infinity Ward had been doing incredible work, and now this kind of like 
messes that up a little bit. Not that Infinity War did this game, but you know, by it being a sequel, the first ever sequel, which is like a, such an insane distinction of just like, it's our first ever sequel that we made in a year instead of two. Oh, oh okay. It's not that, I mean, sure, fine. And you can continue to play together in the same sub franchise. We heard you loud and clear. It's like such a weird, like, okay, yeah, I don't know if they had, if it had been a couple of years, like, you know, I don't think that Vanguard and black ops, cold war were especially great games. So, um, so sure. Yeah. If you want to keep people in modern warfare for another year, I guess that's fine. As long as it's good. Oh, wait, maybe if you took it some more time with it, maybe that would have helped. Um, it's fr yeah, so it's frustrating. I don't know. Uh, congratulations to Microsoft. You bought it just in time. <laughs> Man. They gotta be at least a little... At least a little bummed out. But, I, you know, hey. These decisions were all made well before Microsoft took the reins. And it's selling fine. Um... I don't know if it's selling quite as well. It's hard to get a read on that because of some of the ways they merged products on the digital end to just like this generic launcher and, and all this other shit. And, and so in the, like the UK box sales were down, but it was still number one, but like what's boxed games in 2023, of course it's going to be down as you know, the people are moving to digital. It's, you know, I think it's a it's it's a little difficult to get a a hard read on any of the data points that are out there and say it's doing great or it's oh it's falling off a cliff you know we don't we don't really know you can probably look at the Steam player counts over the next handful of months here and try to get a sense of like is this maintaining its players or is it sinking like a stone what's going on there and you can at least try to extrapolate some things there um, but. Uh, I don't whatever, man. I, I don't know where they go from here uh, other than they just need to make a great game. Turns out that was what they did when Modern Warfare was rebooted the first time around. Like the franchise felt like it was damn near in free fall. Not from a sales perspective, but like just creatively, it just felt like something that was losing relevance every single year. Uh, it was, you know, falling off a cliff creatively. And then Modern Warfare came out. They made all these dramatic engine changes and, and, and caught up on tech in a way that they hadn't in a long time. So a lot of the audio was better and they just um, delivered a fantastic game. And that got everything back on track for a little bit. Even if the games that came out in the two years following were kind of not great. Uh, it bought them enough time to get to Modern Warfare 2. And now, yeah, I don't know. Here we are. Here we are. Modern Warfare 3. But hey, like I said, it's not like Modern Warfare 3 was an amazing game the first time around either. So I suppose in some sick way, the cycle continues. It's a shame. I, uh, you know, as, as someone, I, I played last year's Call of Duty all year. Not, you know, I fell off it quite a bit, but I still would come back to it every, you know, I was definitely playing it like what, a minimum of once a month through this entire run. Um... And I, yeah, I, I don't know. This this feels like a real uh, it feels bad. It feels like a, a, a like it, it, at its worst, it, it feels like a bad game. At its best, it feels like this kind of mediocre, kind of limping forward. Like, hey, you can slide faster now. Do you want to wear a vest? We changed the we change the way you build a custom loadout ever so slightly. That's that's cool, right? If you take this vest, you can wear two pieces of gear. But if you take this vest, you can't wear boots. They should make you barefoot when you pick that one. Anyway. That's Modern Warfare 3. And then there's zombies in it, which seems terrible. I don't know. Uh... They've, they streamlined and simplified a lot of the leveling up of guns and, and a lot of the unlock system there where it was like, oh, this gun is similar to this gun. So parts from this will go to this and do that. Like, like the, the weird tree of unlocks and stuff is gone and, and 
gun tuning is gone, which is probably actually a, a better, well, that's probably a, a fine thing in the grand scheme. But um, anyway, it's Call of Duty. We got some emails about it, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about it at the end of the show. But let's move on. Uh, let's take a quick break, and we'll come back, and we'll get into the news. Winter is here, and you know what that means. It means trying to figure out how to keep the house at just the right temperature so that when you go to sleep, you're not getting too cold. You're not getting too warm. You don't want to let the heater run. You don't want to do this. You want to do that. Ugh. It's a mess. But there's an answer. It's a way to stay at the perfect temperature all night long using silver-infused bed sheets by Miracle Made that were inspired by NASA. That's right. These sheets have self-cooling properties for better quality sleep. This silver-infused fabric, NASA-inspired, mind you, uh, they're thermoregulating. So they're designed to keep you at the perfect temperature all night long so you get better sleep every single night. And they're self-cleaning. That silver is not just there for show. It's not just there to look a little spendy. Silver also prevents up to 99.7% of bacterial growth leaving them staying cleaner and fresher three times longer than other sheets. You know, it keeps the stink out of them. No one wants that. You know, and, I mean, if you, I mean, if you want stinky sheets, you know, I, hey, I don't know what, I don't, I don't remember what life you're living. I'm living a life of comfort and quality because Miracle Sheets are luxuriously comfortable without the high price tag of other luxury brands, and they feel as nice, if not nicer, than sheets used by some five-star hotels. They make the perfect holiday gift. For your spouse, friends, family, who doesn't want better sleep and luxurious feeling bed sheets? And hey, also, these come with three free towels. That's like two gifts in one. That's a gift and then another gift slid in the middle of it. You're like gift on gift on gift on gift. Just in time for the holidays. Hey, stop sleeping on bacteria, you know? It clogs up your pores. It causes breakouts. It causes acne. Sleep clean with Miracle. I, you want to get on board? Yes. Yes, you do. Go to trymiracle.com slash Jeff to try it today or gift it to someone special this holiday season. And here's a special deal for you right now within the sound of my voice. Save over 40%. And if you use the promo code Jeff at checkout, you will get three free towels and save an extra 20%. What? What? Miracle is so confident in their product. It's backed with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you aren't 100% satisfied, you will get a full refund. Upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash Jeff and use the code Jeff to claim your free three-piece towel set and save over 40% off. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash Jeff to treat yourself a friend or a loved one this holiday season. And hey, thanks to Miracle Made for sponsoring the episode. Okay, let's get into the rest of the news. The Game Awards nominees for all of their categories were announced yesterday. I'm going to pull up the email with that here. Uh, okay, that's... Uh, no, sorry, that's... Yes. Here's the nominee list. Um, we won't go through every category, but uh, for Game of the Year... This is about how I figured it would work out with one slight exception. Uh, for Game of the Year, the six nominees are Alan Wake 2, Baldur's Gate 3, Spider-Man 2, Resident Evil 4, Super Mario Brothers Wonder, and The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. Um, I thought... Uh, if, if you asked me to pick six, I would have picked um, Starfield over Resident Evil. I would have thought that Starfield, and that's not like, that's not me saying what I think the best game, you know, that, that's just what I, what I would have thought would have made the cut here for these six nominees is that I, I would have thought that Starfield would have gotten through. Despite reaction to Starfield being a little all over the map, I still thought that it would, it would pull its way onto this list over something like a um over something like a Resident Evil 4. Um and that's the only one with 6. Everything else is 5. Um and so I guess in some way I I maybe 
think because I was originally thinking it was five, and so I would have thought that it would have been Alan Wake two, Baldur's Gate, Spider Man, Zelda, and Starfield. Uh, not no no Mario, no Resident Evil. Um, and so oh, is uh some of the indie? Okay, yeah, there's some other. Um. Yeah, Starfield. Yeah. Bryn says, I, I've seen very little Starfield talk since like right after it came out. I agree. I feel like I read an article last week from a modding team that was trying to craft a bunch of mod framework stuff for the game and finding it slow going. Um, but yeah, Starfield discussion feels like it really kind of fell off uh, fast. Tech Noir says no Jedi Survivor nomination. I mean, that game shipped in a really messed up state. So I, I you know, um, that's not surprising to me that Jedi, I, I, I would not have expected Jedi Survivor to make a game of the year list uh, at all. Uh, just even qualitatively, even, you know, if we, if we kind of move past the bugs, which I don't think that that's, <laughs> um, I don't know that we're past the bugs. Um, I don't know that Jedi Survivor kind of lives on this list with a lot of these other games. These are big games. Not that Jedi Survivor is small. Like there are things I like about it for sure. Um, but I also, I personally, I had a hell, I, I, it was found it impossible to play. Literally it was locking up left and right for a good long time. Um, you know, we get into best game direction, Alan Wake 2, Baldur's Gate, Spider-Man, Mario and Zelda. Best narrative, Alan Wake 2, Baldur's Gate, Cyberpunk, Phantom Liberty, Final Fantasy 16, and Spider-Man. Um, best art direction, Alan Wake 2, Hi-Fi Rush, Lies of P, Super Mario, A Brother's Wonder, and Zelda. A lot of Mario and Zelda on these, uh, on these bigger ones, which makes sense. It makes sense on the quality of those games and makes sense because they're those franchises, you know? Um, yeah, cyberpunk. I don't know. Like I, I tried to play Phantom Liberty and found it, uh, really boring from a narrative standpoint. So I guess I'm like slightly surprised to see it show up there. Um, hi-fi rush made it onto the best audio design list, which I think makes a ton of sense. Um, There's best independent game and best debut indie game, which are kind of your two indie categories. Debut being like the first game from a studio. Uh, Pizza Tower made the best debut uh, list, which is correct. <laughs> um, and then, of course, like every, every year, uh, people debate on what is or isn't an independent thing. Um, this year's, uh, controversy is around Dave the Diver, um, which was published by Nexon and, um, Nexon is not an independent company. Mint Rocket, the team that made it, I believe is owned by Nexon. So that's a weird fit. Um, I wonder if that's an education thing, you know, like the, I, I don't, I, I, I get the impression that like the game awards just kind of processes what was voted in and puts it on the list. And, and that to me says that a lot of judges didn't realize that Dave, the diver was made by Nexon. I mean, we could get into the the endless arguments about what is truly independent and what is an independent vibe and what, you know, is indie an actual thing or is it just an aesthetic? That's the, the music discussion. Um, is a mess, right? Um, I, and I'll, yeah, sorry, I should preface this by saying I am a judge for these awards. I'm not going to talk specifically about what I, um, what I picked in these categories. Other than to say, I don't see a lot of El Paso elsewhere on this list, and that's a shame. More people should play El Paso elsewhere. Um, 
But yes, the description for a best independent game has always been like the, a game made outside the traditional publishing system. That's, that's kind of how they try to define it. And um, yeah, I don't know. Dave the Diver is a weird one. Um, Dave the Diver is a weird one. I don't know. And I think that, you know, the, the genre stuff ends up a little weird. Um, like the splitting the difference between what is an action game versus what it is an action adventure game is always crazy. It's, it's always crazy. You know, we always defined it back in the day as action adventure games have inventories. Action games do not. Um, because action adventure, you had to call it something because adventure game al already meant something on PC. When you talk about adventure games, you're talking about Scum Engine, you're talking about King's Quest, you're talking about point and click ass adventure games. And so you needed something to... The console version of an adventure game is not that, it's a different thing. And, um, and so... Uh, action adventure as a concept kind of rose out of that specific distinction of, okay, we, we need to, we don't want to call it console style adventure game because the, what is the fuck does that mean? That, that would be even, even dumber now when everything comes to every platform, but it, it eventually, you know, it, it eventually evolved into this action adventure type thing. Um, and so it was always like, well, Tomb Raider is an action adventure, right? Because it's, you're kind of, you're not just always running to the right. You're not, you know, doing the 3D equivalent of running to the right. Uh, you are finding things and solving puzzles. You are doing a little bit more than uh, what we would consider an action game. Where that kind of breaks down for me a little bit in situations like this is Spider-Man 2 is an action adventure. Dead Island 2 is in action. I Dead Island 2 is, you know, you you're you're taking on quests, you're literally leveling leveling up and spending skill points and doing, you know, there's there's the the activities you perform in Dead Island 2 even though it is a first person shooter, that's an action adventure game. Um, you know, it's kind of edging into that adventure, edging into that RPG kind of mechanic thing. And, 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 you know, it, it, I guess what I'm saying is all of this kind of highlights that genres are fucking crazy now because everything has RPG mechanics and everything, you know, like there's, um, everything has a little bit of everything when it comes to the big single player experiences and, and whatever, you know, fucking RoboCop has a skill tree, you know, as you know, it's crazy, right? Um, but Dead Island 2 in actions feels really weird to me, especially alongside a game like, you know, Hi-Fi Rush, Ghost Runner 2, Armored Core 6. Armored Core 6 is a weird one. I guess that's a pure action game, I guess. Like, what? you know, what you're out of mission experience is just building sicker fucking robots, right? So... So I suppose, you know, that is, that is action. Um... You know, Mario is action. Zelda is action adventure. Like it's, you know, um, Remnant Two is in action, which is you know, again kind of weird because Remnant Two, some of those touch points are, um, you know, edging into the Souls game territory, which I would not call those standard action games. You know, Remnant Two the character building aspects of it, the gear, the, you know, like all of those sorts of things to me edge it pretty squarely into action adventure. But uh, that's not this to me. This isn't a criticism of the game awards. To me, this is just that like a lot of these genres have, be have become kind of meaningless. Um, like the distinction between action game, action adventure game and RPG like they they've they've blended together so much um yeah like someone in chat is trying to say that souls games are rpgs and that remnants an rpg mm. yeah. 
they're action adventure games. Uh, they're action adventure games that at some point people started calling them RPGs to try to make them seem deeper than they are. I, I don't know, like the um, it has, it has RPG elements the same way every game has RPG elements. You know, RoboCop is a Souls game. Is what I'm saying. Um, they have levels and stats. Call of Duty has level is levels and stats. Is that a role playing game? I level up cars in Forza to unlock more parts. If I have a level 7 Supra, is Forza a car PG? Um, action RPG is an interesting term as well that gets broken because classically Diablo and Diablo style games were the games that we thought of as action RPGs when the, when the terminology was when the terminology came into vogue, it was almost specifically to describe Diablo, if I remember correctly. Um, and then eventually we get into the whole RPG discussion itself because role-playing games mean different things on PC versus console as well, or, or they did classically, because that's why the term JRPG came about. It was largely, you know, it, it was largely meant to denote that it was a an RPG on consoles, which was different than what RPGs were on computers. And then those games started being made outside of Japan. You had a whole champagne versus sparkling wine situation. Um, and also the, you know, like the, but, and also again, every game started coming to every platform. And so, you couldn't say console style RPG. You can't say console style, R style RPG in a world where Baldur's Gate exists on consoles now, you know, as, as just one example of many, you know, but, uh, but these days, so that's the thing, you know, like it's, it's funny because people talk about Starfield, which did get nominated for best RPG, but people talk about Starfield and the Bethesda games as role-playing games. But buddy, those are action adventures uh, with RPG elements in the character building department. Like those started becoming RPGs because people stopped knowing what RPGs were because the definition of RPG has gotten soft because players are soft. So in a world where people don't really play a lot of quote unquote, re it, it, it's like refreshing, even though it, it, it didn't really click with me, it's very refreshing to see Baldur's Gate 3 entering these categories, getting into game of the year and getting into all of this other stuff, because that is a role playing game. Fallout 3 is a fucking first person shooter that you can occasionally stop and also you can level up some stuff like the Bethesda games calling them RPGs is one of those modern things where if you look at it in the grand scheme of games the mechanics in that game and everything else this uh, real time shooter this first person shooter Starfield Um, it's cl way closer to the action adventure definition than the RPG definition and people that are freaking out saying, no, they're definitely RPGs. It's like, no, you, the marketing told you they were RPGs long enough. And you finally started believing it because they don't make a lot of real RPGs anymore. And so this is what you're left with. Um, that's not to say that they're bad games, but it's that they're action adventure games. That's, uh, you know, they, they fit much more cleanly into that department than they do into the kind of classic definition of role-playing game. But again, it's all meaningless now. All of it. Because everything has everything in it. And the Bethesda games are maybe one of the best examples of that. They're just like, hey, check it out. We made a first-person shooter, but you can level up a bunch and talk to people and it has dialogue trees and all this other shit. I'm like, okay, what is it? I'm like, well, we're going to tell you it's an RPG. Okay. That's not right, but okay. 
Uh, there's people in chat saying it's a bad take, and I'm saying you're fucking crazy. You're fucking wrong. <laughs> if you if you disagree on that, uh, like that feels like this feels like very plainly. This is very plain. This stuff. That's not a like like that's not, I, that's this doesn't feel like a bold take. This is just like, hey man, this is where these games came from. If you've been doing this long enough, you would know that. But they don't really. They don't really make that they make that fucking work anymore. Um Best Fighting has a rhythm game in it <laughs> called God of Rock. Um as well as Mortal Kombat, Street Fighter, Nickelodeon All Star Brawl 2, which I don't think is a very good game at all, and Pocket Bravery. Um Are we, are we going to keep talking about this? I don't know. Like, like people are, yeah. I mean, people are like, so Witcher 3 isn't an RPG? No, it's an action adventure game. You walk around, you swing the sword of stuff, like you fucking hit people and do, you know, you, it's, again, it, <laughs> it's, it's not, yeah. Uh, these games have RPG elements and the definition of RPG has changed. The definition of RPG has widened and softened as years have gone on. Um, and so I think classically, if you go back to the games, when, when that de those definitions were not as fuzzy, when they were a little more rigid, and you try to compare those games to other games from back then, I think that those games would be more direct comparisons to games we think of as action-adventure games than they would be to role-playing games, lineage-wise. Lineage-wise. Um... Pocket Bravery, I feel like, is a game that's been kicking around for years, but I guess it did it exit early access this year or something? I'm not really sure. Um, Disney Illusion Island made its way into Best Family Game. Um, as did Sonic Superstars, which, uh, if you love your family, Maybe don't do that to them. Super Mario Brothers Wonder is also on the best family game list, which is weird. Um, because I don't think the multiplayer aspects of that game are especially good. I, I've been kind of chipping away at some of that stuff and trying to... Um, you know, like 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 the multiplayer aspect of, of that game, I think, is is undercooked great game but that aspect of the game i don't think i don't think uh works very very well um as far as like best family game the idea of like sitting down with your family and playing that game i no, i, I don't i do not want to do that um best sports slash racing has uh feet well whatever ea sports fc 24 and then four racing games, F1, Forza, Hot Wheels Unleashed 2, and the Crew Motorfest. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's it, It's a weird year for racing games. Um, I suppose those are they. I, I could have seen UFC on this list um, in terms of sports. You could have maybe put well, I don't know. Like Hot Wheels Unleashed 2. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess. I don't know. Like AEW probably would have been qualified for this category. I just don't think the game's good enough. But also, I think it's better than some of the games that are on the list. So it's eh, kind of a weird toss up there. Um, Best multiplayer is Baldur's Gate 3, Diablo 4, Party Animals, Street Fighter 6, and Super Mario Wonder. I think the online kind of fun, the the cool online aspect of Mario is really great. Um, but best multiplayer again, again, I don't, I don't know about that. Uh, most anticipated Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, Hades Two, Like a Dragon, Infinite Wealth, Star Wars Outlaws, and Tekken Eight. That's a good list. Um. That's a, that's a that's a that's a solid list. 
And then um, I, I, I don't, there are uh, categories that I don't nominate for. I think that they, they do a separate ballot for people in the esports world. And so they have things like content creator of the year uh, and best esports game and best esports athlete and best esports team and coach and event. And I'm like, I don't know. You can try to tell me that Blast.TV Paris Major 2023 was the best esports event of the year. And I will go, okay what um but yeah um but i think you know like like the the genre stuff i i you know i think the game awards is right to try to have more categories rather than less categories fewer categories um but i think that this is a problem with all awards presentations is that genre is either increasingly ridiculously general or specific in a way that doesn't result in an interesting conversation. And so that's a situation you end up with where, where you have to merge sports and racing. Um, because not all racing games are sports games. I like, Hot Wheels Unleashed 2. Like, okay, F-123, that's a sports game. Forza Motorsport is a sports game, but Hot Wheels Unleashed 2 Turbocharged is not a sports game. I would not even consider the Crew Motorfest to be a sports game in the in the way that Forza is. Um, and so merging sports and racing is weird but it makes sense because you need to have five games on a list. And if you just did sports, you'd be like, I guess Madden, like you'd end up with a lot of games that get thrown on there that probably don't deserve to be acknowledged because it's the same thing. And then on racing, there isn't always, there aren't always enough racing games out every single year to make that conversation interesting. And I think fighting ends up in this situation every year. I feel like this was a really good year for fighting games between Street Fighter and Mortal Kombat. Mortal Kombat still in need of some patches. Um, but because the category has to get filled out, you end up with Nickelodeon All-Star Brawl on there, a game that doesn't... Um, well, whatever. Maybe some people like that game. I feel like it did not review super well. I feel like a lot of the coverage on it was like, yeah, this is a kind of a bad platform fighter. Um, I played some of it. Uh, they provided a copy. And and so I, I spent some time playing as Garfield and some of the other characters and going like, this is a bad, this is a bad one of these. I would rather they bring back multiverses. Um... Multiverse? Multiverses. It's all, sorry, it's all a blur now. Should bring back Rumbleverse, the ultimate sports game. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. Like, I, I think that the, the thing I think that you have to kind of consider with all of this is that a lot of words, awards as a concept are always going to be inherently kind of weird. Um, especially when you're doing genre breakdowns and and trying to find these different cuts of a game to have you know as someone who tried to put on awards presentations every year for a lot of years too the the hardest part was always like what are the interesting conversations to have about games this year and how do you build categories in such a way to facilitate those conversations um And yeah, I, I think that by and large, I think a lot of the genre stuff is, is not a great way to do it. Um, you know, again, because, because of the reasons we talked about, because like get nothing is a pure genre game anymore. Like, you know. Mortal Kombat 1 has RPG elements. Street Fighter 6 has a whole mode where you level up an original character and put mo you know, moves on them and all this other stuff. And that's not to say it's not a fighting game. It's just that everything has all these elements in it now. 
and um and so i think with that in mind you kind of just have to like accept that this stuff is is always a little weird and trying to classify games is uh, in a very neat and organized way um is extremely foolish at some point you know in the through the 80s into the 90s games were a lot more rigidly designed and so it was much easier to throw them into these categories. First person shooters were first person shooters. And then some of them started to, you started to be like, Oh, well, wait a minute. What's, are we going to put tech war in the same category as rise of the triad? <laughs> Is that a meaningful conversation? I don't, you know, I don't know. Um, first person games were always weird because the, you know, they're, you would have a couple lumped in there that were very clearly different types of games, but they were still being thrown in alongside the dooms of the world and whatever else. When it was like, oh, you're kind of trying to have a tell a story and have like, you know, you're kind of edging into the immersive sim category or whatever. But like, that's, that's why, you know, that's, that's why I'm talking about these games are not RPGs. These games are because nothing is anything anymore because everything is everything. Put that on a shirt. Um, because that stuff used to be a lot easier to classify. You knew what everything was at a glance. You're like, okay, that, that fits in with this. That fits in with this. The classic definition of this is this. And then everything got muddy in a way to where they're trying to pass off stuff as whatever they want. And, and so it makes it, I think, you know, like the... So I'll say, you know, when, when presented with this blank nominee form, it comes with a jury guide that tries to describe what belongs where. And it doesn't necessarily, it's not like listing games and saying, this is going to qualify for this. If it qualifies at all, uh, it, it's more like these types of games go here. These types of games go here. Um, and trying to define the categories specifically for, um, you know, for, for people that are, are trying to fill this out and, and and vote and, and make intelligent choices and, and so on and so forth. Um, but yeah, I, I think a lot of that stuff is, yeah, a, a lot of that stuff is, is still am, ambiguous. Um, in a lot of ways, I think that like, you know, ambiguous also, I think they, they've, for the longest time they've done the game awards has done game of the year, but also best game direction. And like, I think the vibe of that makes sense, but I think the particulars of it, um, I think get a little murky. And, uh, and yeah, so those are the nominees. They're gonna, um, they're going to have their award show in early December and um, maybe we'll watch it here. I don't, I don't know that I'm going to go. I don't, I don't think I'm going to make it out uh, this year, you know, with the new, with the new baby and all, I think I might hang out here. So maybe we'll, maybe we'll do a live stream of some kind. Um, and uh, watch a dead death stranding I was going to say a Dead Rising 2 trailer. Wouldn't that be... We've decided to reboot the Dead Rising franchise by making a new Dead Rising 2. That's actually the right answer. <laughs> yes. No, yeah, make Dead Rising 2. Uh, Death Stranding 2, which is like Dead Rising 2, but probably worse. Um, Steam Deck. They went all these lengths and said, ah, we're not going to make a new Steam Deck until we're confident that uh, there can be a more, you know, that the power, that there's, there's, there's meaningful changes we can make without sacrificing battery life and so on and so forth. Um, but they announced a new Steam Deck last week. Pre-orders start in a couple of days here. It is an OLED Steam Deck. Uh, it is not, you know, it is not a dramatically more powerful. It is not a full follow-up to the original steam deck. It just seems like, Hey, here's an, an OLED version of the steam deck. It goes from a seven inch screen to a 7.4 inch screen. Uh, the, there's slightly better battery life. It's a 90 Hertz screen instead of a 60 Hertz screen, 
But uh, same resolution, 1200 by 800. Um, same RAM, better battery life. It has Wi-Fi 6E in it instead of just, I guess, AC, which is what is that, 5. It's slightly lighter. And I guess it is a, the processor is, uh, it's a six nanometer chip instead of a seven nanometer chip. And in some of the testing, I guess the digital foundry has done, they have found that there is, are slightly, there are some incredibly slight performance increases that they're finding. Oh, it's it's because of the, the Ram speed. That's what it is. Um, by and large, um, 6,400 mega trans, what is it? Mega transactions? Per, I forget what MT slash S is, um, but that's a measurement of RAM speed, I guess, that they're doing these days. Um, so mildly more mega transfers. That's what it is, of course. Me- mega transfers. That's what we're doing. Uh, so it is a somewhat more powerful Steam Deck, but not really. It is designed to kind of fit in the same power lane is the original it is just something that they are replacing uh the mid the middle and high end models of the steam deck are getting replaced i'm going to try to bop over to steam here so i can get a look at that but that's um it's exciting it's exciting uh i pre-orders open on the 16th at 10 a.m. So they will continue to sell um, a 256 gig uh, old, quote unquote, Steam Deck for $399. Um, But the other models are going away in favor of the OLED model. They will sell a 512 gig OLED for $549 and a one terabyte OLED for $649. Um... It will come with a, well, yeah, no, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, Wi-Fi 6E, it's the, the battery is, they're, they're claiming two to eight hours of gameplay on the old Steam Deck, three to 12 hours on the new one. They are also, um, blowing out the 64 gig LCD, blowing out, I mean, these are not, these are cheaper, but not cheap. Um, $349 for the 64 gig LCD Steam Deck, 449 for the 512. Um, and they're also selling a limited edition version of the one terabyte OLED model that will be a different color. It's like transparent. It looks fucking cool. Um, sounds like from some of the reporting that they've retextured some of the uh analog sticks it sounds like the sound the speakers have improved uh and a few other things like that um i don't know that they've said when they're shipping uh i i did not see that in the reporting uh but i haven't spent a ton of time uh I watched a couple of people talking about it. Um, and, uh, I, I want one. So I, I'm, it's interesting. I am using my steam deck slightly less these days, uh, because I'm no longer, my, my son doesn't sleep in this room anymore, so I can just use this computer until I, until I don't need to. And so the, the steam deck is getting slightly less use because I'm, I'm not in a situation where I need to be quiet in this room as often. Um, but these improvements sound great. Um, OLED HDR screen sounds like a great fun upgrade. Um, but also it's not more powerful and games, you know, requirements on games are, feel like they're starting to increase and it feels like, you know, as we get into next year, there's going to, you know, eventually be another jump in, in that sort of stuff. And so, um, you start to wonder how, how long does the steam deck have before they have to really, before they have to do some kind of upgrade just to keep up with games, like our, our games requirements going to start to shoot through the roof. 
Um, I guess the, the, the other side of that is that there are plenty of games coming out all the time that have very low requirements, a ton of indie games coming along. Like, you know, there should still be a wide variety of games coming out for years to come that will run just fine on this class of hardware. And also the, you know, the, the next step up for something uh, in the size of a steam deck is either super expensive or doesn't exist yet. Um, so it's not as simple as just like, we're making a follow-up to a steam deck and it, look at it, it runs, you know, like it's even more expensive. It's crazy. Battery lasts 20 minutes. Um, like in some cases, those parts just don't really, you know, it's, it's hard to find that in a, in a form factor that small. So I don't know. You start to look at the Steam hardware survey and what type of PC hardware people are generally using to play games. And you start to think like, oh, maybe the Steam Deck will be fine, like quote unquote fine in a lot of ways for years to come um, because developers won't want to target just the high end. Um, I heard Alan Wake 2 runs okay on lower spec machines. I have not heard anyone talk about it specifically on the Steam Deck. I don't, I don't know what the, what the story is there. Um, but yeah, you know, um, we'll see. I, I am, I am very interested in trying out one of these new ones for myself. I'll say that much. Um, I am very, I, I think that this space is fascinating uh, I think that the, the kind of the portable PC, the portable gaming PC, not that it was invented by valve, obviously what the GPD went, you know, there's been all these weird devices for years, but the steam deck finally tried to put it together into a package that had a good interface and made sense. And, uh, <laughs> and that goes a long way. And then you had Asus coming out with their thing and. Um, I'm sure that thing is probably better than it was when I had one, but, eh. uh, and then the Lenovo Legion go, I think is out that came out a couple weeks ago. It was like Halloween. I thought was when it was coming out. I have not heard a single thing about those, um, good or bad. I have not seen anyone talking about the, the Lenovo thing. Um, but I was considering, you know, because I, because I tried out the, the ROG ally and hated it. I thought I would try out the, the Lenovo thing, but, uh, but have not. So I don't know. Um, but I do like the way that, that valve has built the steam deck. I do like the software end of it, the way they have integrated everything. I think they've done a lot of really smart work and, and it's cool. So I, I, I am, I am tempted to try to get one of these limited edition transparent steam decks and failing that to get us on one of these OLED steam decks. I don't know. I'm very, I'm very interested in it. Um, so we'll see, like I said, pre-orders for that open Thursday. Uh, according to GameDeveloper.com's uh, recap of a recent earnings call, Sony has pushed back about high, half of its planned live service games. This is uh, from Hiroki Totoki of Sony. He said, of the 12 titles, six titles will be released by fiscal year 25. That's our current plan. As for the remaining six titles, we are still working on that. And then it's, it's not like we stick to certain titles, but game quality should be the most important thing, which is weirdly vague. Um, I don't know. Yeah, we, we had heard that, that maybe some of Sony's live service dreams were encountering uh, harsh realities and that uh, maybe some of those are going to push back, killed, whatever else. But man, you know, Six games will be released by fiscal year 2025. So that's not that far off in the grand scheme of things, I suppose. Um, and then you see that, you know, the, the, the talk that around the bungee layoffs that, that destiny Two was off like 45% or some insane number on revenue. If that ends up, if, if that's true, like it's, there's a lot of, 
hand wringing around free to play and live service and everything at the moment that um feels like a correction it feels like people realizing like hey th like if our game's not going to crack into the top three ones of these we might as well not put it out in the first place because it's not going to hit the numbers we need to hit and and all of those sorts of things um and so you're seeing a few cases of developers kind of rescoping their game one way or the other disney uh, Game Loft just kind of did something like this with Disney Dreamlight. What is the Disney Dreamlight Valley was originally going to be a, uh, a game that was about to go free to play. And then as they were about to exit their early access kind of founders pack scenario and go free to play, instead they announced, hey, um, we've been looking at the data. And we're just going to not do that. We're going to continue selling this game for money because that's how we can support it. And so some people are really unhappy about that. Some people are lauding it as like, oh, thank God, we're, you know, you're going to take the free to play boot off our neck and nickel and diming. Oh, don't, but don't worry. Uh, a lot of these games will find ways to do both. <laughs> um, just because they're going to start charging you money for the game doesn't mean that they're abandoning all hope of further monetization. It just means that they'll try to find a different way to do it. Um, at least with a game that's already out in some form, right? Um, Remedy did something similar from the sounds of things. This is a uh, Video Games Chronicle uh, report here. A uh, multiplayer game that was under the codename Vanguard. Was this the thing that people thought was a multiplayer-focused control game not control 2 but a I thought I remembered hearing that there was a control 2 and a control multiplayer so I don't know if this is that or, or maybe that was just old was that as that con project condor anyway I don't know okay separate thing codename Vanguard is dead because it is now going to proceed under the new codename Kestrel and it will be a quote premium game with a strong cooperative multiplayer component it is still being published by Tencent uh, that was the original announcement is that, hey, we're making a thing with Tencent and it's going to be this free-to-play multiplayer focused thing. Um, that is still published by Tencent, but they did put out a statement saying, uh, according to videogameschronicle.com, both companies agreed that making the game free-to-play may be risky as the market changes. And there's a quote here, due to uncertainties in creating a successful game to the rapidly changing free-to-play market and associated risks, the parties have discussed a new direction for the game project, which will be given the new code name Kestrel, and it will return back to the concept phase as they take another crack at it. it says here the core leadership and select members of the dev team will stay on Kestrel while some of the other folks who are working on it will be distributed to other projects at the studio. Uh, the CEO of Remedy says, we have made some great strides in free-to-play and multiplayer development in Vanguard. After a lot of careful consideration, we believe that taking on a new direction where the game will be built more around Remedy's core competencies is the right way to go. We are creating another distinct Remedy game with Tencent's continued support in making a great, a great cooperative multiplayer experience. So... So they seem like that's the right move. They, it sounds like that they, they believe that is the right move for their game, for that specific game. And that, you know, that may perhaps remedy is not, perhaps remedy is not built to manage a long-term free to play project, uh, in the first place. And so moving in this direction maybe gets them, uh, back into their wheelhouse and sets them up for greater success. Um, Either way, interesting, and I wonder, you know, because we see these games come and go, right? You see these games come out, bomb, the plug gets pulled, or whatever happens, you know, you, you, you know, whether it was Hyenas getting canceled before it even came out, whether it was Rumbleverse making it for six months or something like that, like, it's clear that it's brutal out there on the free-to-play end, but also the live service end is really... Like, think about live service. Like, you know, you've got... What's the addressable market for that? Um, 
Because people either want to play a game that way or they don't. People are either willing to open themselves up and say, yes, here's a game I would like to play exclusively or, 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 or be playing quite a bit of for the next three years or whatever. And then you've got players who are like, no, I'll play a game for six months and move on to something else. Like, you know, Call of Duty is a great example of, of like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm going to play the multiplayer in that for a few months. And then if it sticks the landing, then I'll keep at it. If not, I'll go play something else, whatever, who cares? I'll get my money out of it one way or the other, blah, blah, blah. Maybe not this year, but you, you get the general point. Um, so when we get into live service, like you were talking about a world where you already have a lot of players playing, I don't know, Warframe, uh, Destiny, any number of battle royale games, which are not necessarily, I mean, you know, I'd kind of, I'd put that more on the, uh, free to play multiplayer end as opposed to the like live service, like character building, like here's our action RPG that we built, uh, where you can play this thing this way, as opposed to, you know, counter strike two or, or, or war zone or whatever, which are a little more, you're in match, you're out of match. Boom, boom, boom. Um, MMOs and, and free to play MMOs and, and those sorts of things like people commit to those and then they play them for a good long time because that's where their friends are. And so getting that friend group to abandon one game for another is the thing you're actually trying to do. You're not trying to like come up with brand new players who don't play a game like this and say like, Hey, why don't you play this game for the next four or to seven years and, and buy and buy cool emotes from us once a month or so. Like that's a big ask for people that just don't necessarily already play games that way. But if they already play games that way, then they might already have two or three games like that, that they're already playing. And so the act of pulling them out of those games and saying, no, try this one. No, give up on this other one. Play ours instead. Like that's just got to be hard fucking math at some point, unless you're dealing with an established property. If you're, if you're able to come out and say, Hey, this, this is the next destiny game, then that's going to have some built in excitement. I mean, it might be a little weird right now, but generally speaking. And, and, and I think like that establishes out to developers as well, where I think, you know, Bungie will, they'll, there will, let's call it a halo effect. There'll be a, a halo effect of, on marathon because people like destiny or people liked destiny. People will, will try it because they like that developer or liked that developer's work. Um, whereas if you're just like some new Jack out of nowhere with no pedigree, no nothing going like, Hey man, check this out, man. You got a, you've got a foam gun. Um, every game's got a foam gun now, <laughs> you know, uh, that's just a harder sell inherently. And so, uh, you know, I, I think what we're, what, what I would like to say that we're seeing here is everyone kind of smartening up, waking up and going like, dude, if we're not going to crack that fucking code, if, like, like this gamble is too much because we're going to spend three years making this thing and then run an open beta near the end. And people are going to go, this sucks. And then what? Now what? Now what do we do? We didn't pull anyone away from an existing game. We didn't. We we don't have a, a track record of a previous game that we can we can funnel players into our new thing. Like it's just not. Like think about Remedy is a great example, right? So think about the the think about fans of Remedy's games. Single player, story driven fascinating narratives, fascinating techniques for expressing their narratives. These aren't necessarily things that spring to mind when you say free to play multiplayer game. It's not to say you can't try. It's not to say that they, they, you know, they couldn't try to do that. But when we think about narrative in multiplayer focused games, we think about people holding down the skip button to skip cutscenes because they're running this mission for the 90th time. And they don't want to see that shit anymore. Um, and so 
Remedy bringing one of these games out, they're going to have to then turn to fans of games like Control and games like Alan Wake 2 and say, here's our cool free-to-play multiplayer game. We would love it if you tried it out for three or four years. It's got some narrative in it. I mean, we, we, we built a world for it that we think you will like. Um, but maybe it's not expressed in the same way as it is in our other games because of the inherent nature of a multiplayer thing and blah, blah, blah. You know, you kind of end up having it. It's a different thing. It's a different thing. And so that's a tough, that's a tough, that's a tough dragging those players into a genre and style of game that they might not even be the least bit interested in. And so instead you're like, okay, well now we have to find, where are we going to find players? Where do we find players for our thing? If it's not the classic remedy fan, if it's not like max Payne two players going, ah, yes, free to play multiplayer, sign me up. You know, like, how do you do it? Um, and so maybe they hit a wall with that and or they, they kind of woke up one morning and said, dude, it's fucking brutal out there. Like we can make this cool multiplayer co-op thing and we can do it in a remedy like way. But if we have to monetize it for years to come and make it this free to play thing and make sure it's got this number of players and this number of th like if, if they have to do all of that, that's hiring an entirely different studios worth of people with a totally different skill set to focus on that game than the one that they probably have now. I, I, mean, I don't know how many people work at, you know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm way off base there and there are a ton of people with experience in live service working at remedy these days. And I, you know, it's, I, I don't know. Um, but when we think about their track record, that's what the, the conclusion I can't help but come to. Um, but I think to me, this, these sorts of moves, whether it's Disney dreamlight Valley or Sony pushing back half of these live service games or remedy making this move from Vanguard to Kestrel, I can't help but look at it as people waking up and going, we can't. You can't just like limp into this space. You can't just waddle in and be like, we have one of these now too. You have to have a studio that is aligned around it and, and practically built around it, whether it's community support and, and all of that. Like there's so much to do that. Right. So many things have to align that like, it just doesn't, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. And, and again, at the end of it, there's no guarantee that you're going to crack that nut and pull people away from whatever their two or three live service games of choice are. And so on one hand, I'm like, good, they should try to, um, they should, they, they don't, not everyone needs to be making games like this and that's fine. Not everyone needs to chase this stuff because this is, it, it is a gamble. Like the, the people that are doing those sorts of games well have made money hand over fist. We can even lump a World of Warcraft into that sort of stuff. You know, think about World of Warcraft at its peak. How much money they were fucking making. Still, that's probably dwarfed by some, you know, like Candy Crush probably makes more money than that now, right? I don't know. Um, but, you know, it, it's such a hard, it's such a hard gamble. It's such an uphill gamble, I guess, too. So I, I, yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, it's, it's like heartening, I guess, to hear this news that people are trying to like get away from making more free to play. I don't necessarily say that as someone who hates those types of games, but I just think the reality of it is that not everyone can do it because the player base doesn't exist. They're already playing something else. They're already, you know, they're not interested in that type of game or they're already playing something else. And, and, and how do you do that? It's the call of duty problem in a lot of ways, right? Like we were talking about it with X defiant, um, a couple of weeks ago where, you know, call of duty came out and said, now our, our movement stuff is fun and cool too. And now what does X defiant do? Because that was one of the things they were trying to hang their hat on was like, we've got the cool movement from, you know that call of duty is too scared to have these days or, you know, whatever they weren't, they weren't quite as in their, in your face about it. But, um, 
you know, what's the number? The, like the 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 Microsoft, they they want to have like what one billion people playing games across all devices or something. There was you know the stated goal of like when everyone plays, we all win. Um, but we're not there yet, and so until we've got a much larger player base to pull from. If you're making a third person shooter live service action this RPG that if you you know like you've you've got to deal with the realities of the player base as it is today. Uh people that would be interested in that type of game. And uh I think that that math probably gets weird fast. Um You know who doesn't have to worry about that sort of stuff because they're they've got to worry about a, <laughs> everything else. Rockstar Games. Uh, I got an email on the eighth from Rockstar. Hi everyone, please see below for a message from Rockstar Games founder Sam Hauser. Thank you. Next month marks the 25th anniversary of Rockstar Games. Thanks to the incredible support of our players worldwide, we have had the opportunity to create games we are truly passionate about. Without you, none of this would be possible, and we are so grateful to all of you for sharing this journey with us. In 1998, Rockstar Games was founded on the idea that video games could come to be as essential to culture as any other form of entertainment, and we hope that we have created games you love in our efforts to be part of that evolution. We are very excited to let you know that in early December, we will release the first trailer for the next Grand Theft Auto. We look forward to many more years of sharing these experiences with all of you. Thank you, Sam Hauser. Short to the point, they included a Rockstar logo at the top of the email. Um, and so it's an email announcing a trailer that isn't out yet and, and all that sort of stuff. But I, you know... Weirdly enough, this was like a nice email to get because I think it it is reflective. It reminds me of what it reminds me of what Rockstar Games was founded on. And that's that's true. I remember in 98 and 99, I remember the pitch. I remember Rockstar Games trying to do that, trying to like like positioning themselves as like as like we think we want to move this medium forward. And Grand Theft Auto One did not necessarily do that, um, but it put them on the road, right? It um. I've had a lot of ups and downs with Rockstar in terms of like working in this business and I have found them to be very difficult to work with and you there are plenty of horror stories from people who worked directly at Rockstar as to what it has been like working with either of the Housers over the years. Um, I have not been left with the impression that they are nice people um, over there. And, uh, you know, there have been plenty of reports about what the labor conditions were like and that they, that sounds like that they have improved. Um, and sometimes this goal that they have, this, this idea that, that he talks about in the email of that video games could come to be as essential to culture as any other form of entertainment. I think that the goal that they, that stated goal of theirs led them down, led them to become, um, what's the word? I, I was going to say slave drivers. That's a little harsh. Um, full of themselves. They became rock stars. It's aptly named because even out of the gate, like, and I think you have to have this a little bit, though they probably had too much of it. Um, they walked the walk. They were jerks at times. Um, 
And uh, yeah, again, uh, plenty of people who've worked there have had hor horrendous stories about what it was like to work, uh, to work at Rockstar. Um, but I think alongside that, and, and it's a, I, I don't think one excuses the other. Uh, I think that they have, they have helped, they, they have helped achieve that goal. I don't think they did it alone, but in terms of, again, the stated goal, video games could become to be as essential to culture as any other form of entertainment. I think that we are, we are at that point. A lot of, there's still a lot of resistance to video games as a medium because it, it doesn't get the respect that movies get you, the, the people that work in narrative, especially in, in gaming are not given the same respect that screenwriters are in film. And you know, there, there's even internally, even by their own people, um, there's still a lot to do. I think to kind of clean all of that up and, and make it all work. But I think in terms of like, cultural and, and some of it is, you know, as the player base ages, you just had naturally have more people that have played games on this planet. Um, but, um, I, I think that, you know, the, and, and, you know, whether it was them being perfectionists or them being jerks or somewhere in the middle, um, I, I do respect the fucking thing that they did. Um, the the visions they've had for Grand Theft Auto over the years. It's the thing I always say, and I'll say it again right here, right now, because I'm back at that point. And at this point, it probably says more about me. I have said time and time again, when it came time for them to reveal the Grand Theft Auto, I have said, I have no fucking idea what they could do next because of whether it's the way the world changed or the way the, the previous game was, how do you build on top of that game? How do you do this? How do you like the, what do you do from a narrative, like a setting, a time in timeline, everything else, like, you know, from vice city onward, I was just like, I don't know what you do to fucking top that other than like graphics will naturally get better. And Hey, the shooting could be better, I suppose. And blah, blah, blah. Um, I, I think that they have, uh, always found a way to push that franchise forward. That said, I am right back at that point where they're about to unveil Grand Theft Auto 6. And even though we've seen some stuff leak, I have no idea how you top what they've done up to this point. And also, I think that they have a new target because of the success, the success of GTA Online. And will that split their focus in a way that butchers the single player portion of the game in unfortunate ways? I would like to think it wouldn't, but that maybe it will eventually. Um, do I think that GTA 4 is better than Vice City? I think that GTA 4 is obviously newer than vice city. And I think that, that if you look at their games on a timeline of like things, they improved, like you might not like the characters of GTA four and the story of GTA four more than you like vice city. But I also think that there is a richness to the storytelling in GTA four that was not in vice city. Whereas vice city is a little more cardboard cutout characters. And you know, it's like a little more kind of over the top, whatever. Whereas I think that GTA 4, there is a depth to the storytelling there. Again, I, I'm not saying it's as good as the games that came before it, but it is deeper. And also I think 4 from a technology standpoint, from a framework perspective, I think that that game is, was incredibly impressive at its, in its day. I think it gets shit on unfairly. Um, because it's not as boisterous because Nico's story is not as over the top, you know, like as a character, he is not as over the top. Uh, yes, GTA four has bad driving. Uh, I used the taxi mechanic in that game way more than I did in any other, uh, fast. I, I fast traveled my way around GTA four because I didn't want to have to deal with the driving. Um, 
But I think in terms of their focus and in terms of telling the story of that character and, the, and, and all of that stuff, and also, you know, setting aside some of the, like, that, that was the game. That was the fucking, like, ludonarrative, uh, that, that was the game that caused that conversation. Like, Nico doesn't want to do all this killing, but all these missions are you doing this killing. I'm like, yeah, yeah. You're not wrong. Um, but I think GTA 4 gets a bad rap. Uh, I think GTA 5 was a cool game uh, in, in a lot of ways, but it, it to me, that game is in some ways a refinement of some of the stuff that came before it. It's them finding ways to inject a little bit more of the kind of, well, I guess we call it old school at that point, some of the weird shit from the GTA 3 trilogy making its way back into the franchise after four had a much more serious kind of tone. Um, I think the, the triple protagonist stuff in GTA five was like fun from a narrative perspective. I think it made the storytelling interesting. Um, and yeah, I, I think they've, I think they've done really great work. I just don't care about GTA online. I think that's the, the thing for me is I, I can only look at that as like, well, it's done very well for them. Um, and I'll be very curious to see what they have to say about it. Um, because yeah, it's, uh, the world has become an even weirder place and, uh, that, you know, I'm not the first to say it, obviously I've, I've certainly said it before, but like, you know, the, the world is so much crazier than Grand Theft Auto ever was now. It's fucked. It's fucked. It's tragic. Um, and we'll see what happens. You know, I like my hopes for this is that they, they make another You know, fun, good, in uh, uh, compelling single player adventure, and whatever they do with GTA Online, I, I'm I'll I'll happily check it out. I'm very curious, but at the same time, you know the the stuff the the stuff they did over the course of GTA Online and the direction it went and all the role playing stuff that people got into. I find interesting from afar and I just look at it and go like, that's really cool for someone who is not me. Uh, and in fact, what we were talking about before fits right into this GTA online. Look at the number of years that's been out, the amount of money it makes. And now imagine you're coming out with another online game and you're hoping to pull people away from anything, whether, and, and this is one of the games in that, you know, like, like, no, it's not, it's hard, man. I remember when Minecraft came out and Minecraft first started getting really big and the numbers started looking crazy on how many players this was before Microsoft bought it. Um, looking at how long people were playing Minecraft and how much money they weren't spending because they could just buy a copy of Minecraft and be done with it. There was a ton of hand wringing from a lot of different corners of the industry that they were just like, well, now we're going to put our game out and it's good. Uh, we're making like a good eight hour game with a multiplayer mode. And you know, like we're making a fun, you know, triple a game, whatever. But now we have to compete with this thing that kids might play for the rest of their lives. And what if those kids just play Minecraft and never buy another game? And now you've got, Roblox and is this problem going to get worse will kids who grew up playing Roblox graduate into quote unquote traditional video games or will they just keep playing Roblox and then go what's the adult version of Roblox there isn't one I guess I'm done playing games like that that fear um you know you extrapolate that out another 10 years or, and what does that look like I don't know. Someone, someone does someone or at least thinks they know someone at least done the math on it and tried to figure out like, okay, we can do this, do this, do this. Um, but the, the conversations I had of developers like traditional, like long time game developers who had made games for years, who, when my, when Minecraft got big and was 10 bucks or something like that, they were fucking petrified. 
and what that did to change like people that were out there pitching new video games and 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 everything else and just like well now you've got all these people that control all this money saying like well okay your game sounds good is it the next minecraft and you're like no and they're like oh well hmm hmm well i don't know we're kind of looking for either something that's going to be the next minecraft or something so different that it's never that it's going to carve out its own lane entirely so what do you uh what do you think um and so i i think that 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 really you know, a lot of people who weren't making games with online components at the time, I think were especially scared of that because they just saw this massive social experience and they just looked at it and, you know, they were playing it too. They weren't like going like, this game's terrible. They were like, this game's terrible for my business, but also it's fucking incredible. Look at fucking Minecraft. Holy shit. Like they got it. They understood. But how do they, how do they compete with that, with a world where we have an increased number of players who literally only play one video game and that video game isn't going to go away? A video game doesn't get replaced in a year. There's not a sudden thing of like, oh, you have to make a choice to buy the sequel to this next year, and that's our opportunity to sell you something better, and maybe if our game comes out at the same time or a little bit before, you'll get into that instead and won't buy this, and you'll play our game instead, and you'll you'll interact with our thing instead. You know, like the... I don't know. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's fucking weird, man. And now, you know, you end up with Fortnite in those situations, and Fortnite even even more closely resembles traditional games because it's a shooter and because it's this and because it's that. And then, um, or rather traditional video games have bent themselves to more closely resemble Fortnite. Maybe is, maybe is perhaps a better way of putting that. Um, it's interesting. I, I don't, I, I don't know where, you know, there's, I don't have anywhere to go with this. I don't have like any kind of neat conclusion, but this is just one of those things that I think ties into everything we were talking about with what remedy is going through the, the game loft thing, the Sony live service games. I think that this is kind of a long time coming. It's kind of a weird, it's, it's, it's a weird scenario and, and I don't know what the way through it is. You know, you used to think that like, oh, well, mobile games are going to come along and eat it all up anyway. And that kids won't even want consoles. And that was the legitimate fear for a long time there. And now it's not so much that as it is. These games need to be playable everywhere. Uh, it'd be nice if a TV could play this game through streaming or whatever, you know, um, There's a category and that we, we didn't mention it because it's not something that uh, judges are nominating for, but uh, there's a press release out this morning saying that uh, voting for the game awards will take place in Fortnite because they have a category, a user voted category for what is the best user made island in Fortnite. You can, you can make your own stuff in Fortnite. And so they're making a category of like, what's the best user made thing? Um, which is fascinating. I don't know that, I don't think they're letting people vote for like game of the year inside of Fortnite. Maybe they are, but, uh, but it, there is, there is some kind of like Fortnite specific user created category, um, that they've, uh, that they've got going on there. Some, some sponsored thing, I'm sure. Um, It's all just fucking weird, man. It's not, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a really weird industry. It's, it's just, it's so fascinating. I, I love it, man. I, I love following the twists and turns of this stuff. It's, you know, it's never boring um, because the future is so weird and you know, you don't know where the technology is going to go quite, you know, you're not quite sure where it's going to go. And, um, and you do see some, you know, like I, I think the, the generic idea of like, Hey, let's vote on what the best you know, like user created thing in Fortnite is. I think that's a cool idea. Like, why not? Nothing wrong with that. Like I, I don't play enough Fortnite to have an opinion on that, but that's great. They should do that. Um, and I just, I, I like that there's a variety right now. And I think that that's when I talk about some of these developers maybe moving away from free to play and some of this other stuff, I think my, my, in my ideal scenario, 
it's in service of maintaining some of that balance of, hey, some of these games are going to be full priced. Some of them are going to be free to play. Some of them will be discounted, seasonal, this and that. Some of them will be this episodic thing. Some of these things you have to sign up for Netflix to play. Some of them you stream. Some of them you run locally. Some of them, you know, you there's just a lot of wild things happening out there all the time. And I think that that has been very interesting. But a lot of my interest in video games is wrapped up in that variety. A lot of my interest in video games is wrapped up in that balance. And if things skew too far in, in a direction, it's too far in favor of free to play live service. And I, I, play, I play some live service games. I like some live service games. Generally speaking, I don't think it's the worst idea in the world. some people are super against it. I'm not that way. Um, but you can't have every game be that. <laughs> Because not every game is good enough to play for four years straight. And um, they shouldn't have to be. Not every game should be $70 because not every game should be $60. Some games should be $20. Some games could be $25. Some games shouldn't even be $25. I started playing Air Twister. Yu Suzuki's uh, uh, game that came to Apple Arcade about a year ago is now on Steam and some other platforms. It's a Space Harrier-like game. 25 bucks. It's got 12 levels. Uh, the PC port of it is covered with mobile game UI. Uh, which is gross. And you... It has all of these challenge levels that are not all that exciting. And also there's another... Yeah, part of the last Steam demo batch, there was a another Space Harrier style game that was pretty good uh, that had interesting ideas around melee attacks. Um, but the Yu Suzuki game has a bunch of bootleg queen in it. Um, so at least has got that going for it. I forget that guy's the Anyway. That game shouldn't be 25 bucks. It's not $25 worth of entertainment. It's not a bad game, but uh, I've, I've finished it in a couple sittings and I don't want to go do any more of it. Whereas they built it around this idea of just like, you're going to earn stars by playing it, it again and then again and again. And I'm like, I don't want any of these unlockables. I don't need cosmetics for a game I finished. You got 12 levels. I'm good. Um. Anyway, whatever. It, it's... Uh, as always, we are living in interesting times. Uh, Nintendo announced a live-action Zelda film. I, you know, everyone's trying to fantasy cast this movie. I am drawing blanks for every single role. Um, I, I don't, I just, I just, I look at that and go like, okay, yeah. Sure. Is Jack Black gonna play Ganon? <laughs> what are you? What are we? Uh, what are we doing here? Can we get yeah? Create Chris Chris Pratt into a green suit? Can we do that? Um, yeah, I, I don't. I don't know that I have any any take on that at all. They should do that, I guess. I don't know. What do you? Um, I mean, it's a story about an elf who saves a princess from an evil pig man. Like, it, you know, it kind of feels like that, that the, the kingdom. Yeah. I don't know. It, it just feels very like, I, I think when you, you, you know, it kind of starts to sound a little generic except for maybe the pig man part. Um, you know, is Link going to get a raft? Is he going to, is Link going to run around and put bombs on walls to... I guess I shouldn't assume that it'll be based on the first Legend of the Zelda video game. Or the first few. I mean, Death, Death Mountain shows up in a, a number of them, right? But it... Will there be a guy that says... Dodongo dislikes smoke. Will you walk up to a guy? Will, will Link walk up to a guy and say that? Yeah. Or, yeah. Will there be a it's dangerous to go alone like moment in that game when he gets a sword? Like that seems corny as fuck, but. But also. 
kind of cool. I, yeah, I, I don't know. I have very mixed feelings about it. Or rather, I have no, actually no feelings about it other than, yeah, I guess they should do that. That Mario movie did pretty well, and I'd be interested to see what they do with a live action thing. Why not? Um, as more and more of the new, smaller PlayStation 5s get out into the wild, people are able to start to experiment around with that removable drive. If you remember correctly, there's been a bit of a hubbub around... Uh, the requirement of an internet connection when you first set up that drive because it has to pair itself to the console, basically. It has to get online and say, this drive is hooked up to this console. Here's all the serial numbers. And, you know, maybe they'll, maybe they send some encryption around or whatever it is. Um, it sounds like uh, th that was leading to, a lot, leading to a lot of people going like, well, wait a minute. How can, can I unpair it from this in case I want to sell it later? Um, what does this mean 20 years down the line when those activation servers are offline? That part we don't know other than, well, if the activation servers ever go offline, that's bad for anyone who has an unpaired drive or whatever. But in terms of does it make that drive useless forever? Is it permanently paired to a console? No, it sounds like you can either unpair the drive specifically, or if you take that drive and just slap it onto another PS5, it will apparently pop up a thing and say like, Hey man, you can, you got to reboot the console and do this and we'll pair it. And, and so you can sync a drive to a different PlayStation five after the fact. So if you bought one used and it was already paired, it's not going to be useless. It'll just, it'll, it'll be able to pair. Um, so that's, Good. That's that's good news. You know, uh, the the twenty year down the line activation server offline scenario is still real. That's that's still something that is unfortunate and true. But um, but at least in this specific case, you know, you will not end up with a drive that you're like, oh, this thing's useless, or this I bought one thinking it was unpaired, but it's paired, and now what? And um, like that that part of it at least seems like something that they thought of. And that's it for the news. Let's get into a few uh, get into a few emails here. Podcast at guard.bike is the email address. Send in your emails to me and I will I will read them. Um, and I will choose some of them for this year program. Let's see. Uh Let's go back to, I, I am getting more and more emails about wait times on X cloud. Someone did write in and say, oh, they're just bad when the weekly quests roll out. But a bunch of people wrote in to be like, no, they're bad all the time. Um, or especially at prime time, Ian writes in and says, well, I do use my Microsoft rewards points on Amazon gift cards and game pass. I have not used X cloud to complete quests. I have run into xCloud wait times of around 10 minutes at 7 p.m. Eastern on weekdays and weekends. I usually only use xCloud to play multiplayer games that do not have cross-play with friends. The wait times have gotten longer than they used to be. I would be curious to know if this is due to an increase in the amount of users on Microsoft or, or, or I'm sorry, if this is due to an increase in the amount of users or Microsoft devoting less resources to xCloud. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what the what the situation is with that. Uh, Will from Canada writes in and says, just for the sake of information gathering, I've been using Xbox game streaming on my PC and phone for some time now and have never had to wait more than 10 seconds to spin up a game instance. While I've heard that people are waiting 10 minutes, it sounded absolutely insane. Perhaps this is a region or data center thing, which is why I haven't experienced it. I'm across the border in Canada, but I'm still hitting the server in Redmond. I know this because when I play Xbox 360 games in the cloud, I get security emails telling me an Xbox in Washington logged into my account. Maybe I'm getting the good juice from the source, so they've got more racks free. Either way, it seems like quite a discrepancy. Hmm. Yeah, I wonder if it's people in certain certain locations, certain parts of the world have to deal with um with that. Um Jake writes in. I have never played a Yakuza game and was delighted to see the entire series on Game Pass. I started with Yakuza 0 and deemed it the perfect game to use xCloud with when I'm on the go. 
You don't need to have precise inputs for the combat and definitely not for the story. I've been enjoying my time with it. In the beginning of the year, I never had wait times no matter when I played. Once Starfield was released, however, I was put into 15 minute or longer queues whenever I booted it up. This went on for a month or so. Thankfully, I haven't seen any wait times now that the Starfield hype has slowed down. In the future, I find it possible that when a big release is dropped, there will be wait times again. This has been my experience. Yeah, so that's uh, some interesting reports from out in the field. Um, on all the, the wait times here. James writes in and says, it's now Sunday night at 9.30 p.m. It's a 15-minute wait to stream Thirsty Suitors on Game Pass. Um, yeah, that's uh, crazy. Crazy. Alvaro from Cincinnati writes in and says, one of the first games I got from a Game Boy was a Mega Man game. I loved it, so I went on to try it on the NES thinking it was the same thing. Turns out it wasn't. As the expert in all game-related things and as the closest thing to a helpline, how the hell am I supposed to beat that damn yellow monster? I keep shooting it and shooting it, but nothing ever happened. Oh, man, I, don't, I actually don't remember the specifics of what you're supposed to use to beat. The, is he just... Is he referred to as the Yellow Menace? Is that the actual name of that guy? I forget what um, what the official name given to that guy is, but what he, the Yellow Devil, right? Very cool looking. I think you got to shoot him in the eye, right? You need to shoot him in the eye to do damage. Um, elect beam in the eye and then pause. I mean, yeah, that's, yeah. If we're going to use pause glitches, then I suppose. Um, I, that that dude is one of the coolest looking things in video games to this day. The Yellow Devil from Mega Man is still radical. Daniel from Toronto writes in and says, it's that time of year again when every news outlet starts pumping out gift guides. Much like the, much like the return of Mariah Carey's All I Want for Christmas is You, these guides have become an annual annoyance that we just need to collectively tolerate every holiday season. You talked about uh, you, you talked before about the business reasons why these guides exist, but I was wondering if you could shed any light onto the creation of the lists. The lists themselves are often strangely specific, like 25 gifts to get the PlayStation gamer dad in your life. And the items on the list are generally odd. Like, who wants this crap? Any insider of the Nightmare Factory that creates this list would be greatly appreciated. I haven't, I haven't touched that end of of game writing in a lot of years. Um, so I don't, I don't have the answer off the top of my head. Other than the reason they are named so specifically is for SEO reasons. You know, it's like great gifts for the gamer dad. Great gifts for dads and grads and you know like all of that stuff um but yeah there used to be gift guides that would come out around the end of the school year for grads and father's day was around the same time which is why we got two dads and grads and then um you know you do another one around christmas time for the holidays um I always remember them just being like, oh, we're doing gift guides. Does anyone want to recommend anything? And if you want to write a paragraph about why you think it's good, that would be good too. And so, you know, maybe some write-ups would get assigned out. Like, hey, you reviewed this game. Can you write a paragraph about why it's good? We're putting it in this gift guide or something, you know? Um, and it was just like a one person wrangling all of this text together and putting it up, but a lot of different people kind of writing it. Um, I, yeah, I, I don't, I don't really know. It's, I think it just like that, that sort of stuff, um, was just like the, yeah, the, 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 the entire staff would contribute in little bits and pieces and it was never like a hard thing to, to maybe put together. You would always have scenarios where it's like the features editor. So Carrie goose goes probably, um, would probably have a better answer to this question than I do. Um, uh, you know, maybe you take like the, what were the highest reviewed games over the last 12 months? 
or, or, Hey, you got to vet this. Like what's going to be good for dads? Like, Oh, the dad's like football, right? Put Madden on it. You know, like it's, it's really, I don't think that there's some big deep process to vet this stuff. It's more just like, I don't know, man, put NCAA. We got a world war two game we can throw on here. Dads love that shit. Um, and, and, and thus the list is born, I guess. I, I don't know. Yeah. It's, uh, it was hardly a science. I don't think it was more like, oh yeah, I guess we got to do these. We've got to pick like 10 things. Do we care? Do we care? Do, you, do we care about this? It's like, well, we don't want to recommend bad games. So let's, we, we care about it in so far as our name is on it. So don't make it bad. Other than the part where it's kind of inherently, you know, a little bad. Dawson writes in with a conspiracy theory. Today I was thinking about Modern Warfare 3 and the thought occurred to me that the reason that this most recent game was a full game and not a DLC for Modern Warfare 2 could be because Microsoft is trying to run out the, the contract that Activision has with Sony. If I remember right, they had something like three more games and the sequel to Warzone. They also said around the launch of Modern Warfare 2 that they weren't going to do a, a yearly game anymore, but we see what happened to that. Um... So, yeah, I mean, you know, if they did the contract that involved like full price games and then they put out something that's not a full price game, then maybe that doesn't count towards the contract. So you could see a scenario where that is hamstringing some of the creativity or some of the the smart moves they could be making with that franchise and forcing them to box things that they wouldn't otherwise put in a box and sell separately. I don't know that that necessarily happened. I don't know if that necessarily was the... um exact reasoning here. Um, but yeah, you know, it's, it's, that seems unlikely, but I guess, I suppose there's a world in which that is possible. Um, Joe in London, England writes in and says, I'm currently listening to you talk about the Epic client, uh, and it got me thinking about gaming on my Steam Deck. The Steam client on the Deck, Big Picture Mode, and Steam Link all reduce the effort for me to get into a game. It encourages me to casually pick up and play. It's not as easy and or as smooth as a modern console, which have great suspend and resume features, but it's close. Valve has put a lot of effort into the Steam user experience to make buying and playing games frictionless. I don't think twice about using the Steam client. They use... Big green and blue buttons for buying and playing. They use nice flourishes in the game start screens on the deck to make it more fun and visually appealing. Every time I think about a game from the Epic Store, I think, ugh, I have to deal with that client again. This is why I haven't bought Alan Wake 2. Every time I think about interacting with the Epic client on PC or a Steam Deck, I shrug and play something else. There are so many games and Epic exclusives aren't enough of a pull due in part to their abysmal client. I think Epic has failed to invest in their client like Valve here. Obviously, Steam is the smoothest interface on Valve's own hardware, but in my experience, open source emulation software often have better user experiences on the Steam Deck. Integrations with the Steam client, smooth client installation, and ongoing bug fixes, the volunteer emulation community does a better job than a multi-million dollar gaming business. Yeah, yes, you're you're right. I I but also I don't I guess I would say I don't know that enough people have purchased a Steam Deck for this to matter in the grand scheme of things for Epic. Um I think Epic has a lot of work to do just to make their client snappier and more usable on desktop, you know, let alone, you know, going out and supporting Proton or going out, going out and doing a a Steam Deck version of the Epic client. Like, yeah, they could do it. It'd be cool if they did do it. But if I looked at a list of, you know, if I started to like stack rank, like here's the things Epic should be working on and with regards to their store and client, Steam Deck is pretty low on the list. Um, I think there's just a lot of feature work that they should be doing to that client first before they try to tackle you know, anything like that. Um, and also it's, it's like, you know, technically like a competitor's hardware in a, in a way. So, you know, they're not necessarily incentivized to do it in the first place. And so it's, it's just sort of a weird thing. I mean, I'm surprised that they didn't necessarily try to like partner with any of these other, you know, whether it was 
Asus or the, or the Lenovo or whatever for some of these other devices and say like, Hey, pre-install our client. Maybe they, maybe they did pre-install the client, but I know you can, you can certainly install the Epic client onto those devices and, and all that other shit. Cause it is windows. Um, <clears throat> But yeah, I, I just don't, I don't think it's a priority for them. I, I don't, but also I would say, I don't think that the quality, the, the user experience on the Epic client is a priority for them because I think they could prioritize it and make it a lot better. I think there's a lot of things they probably could be doing here to make that a better experience, but I guess I just don't think that they see it as that big of a deal in the grand scheme of things. Right. I mean, cause one would assume they would have the resources to fix this if they really uh, put some muscle behind it. They're not a small company. They're not, uh, they, they're not without resources for sure. But um, at the end of the day, I, I, I like them on Steam Deck. Like, yeah, that'd be cool. It's not a, it's not a priority for them. Um, I think that's more the, more the situation. John from Greece writes in and says, if Bungie didn't leave Activision, they would be part of Microsoft once again after the acquisition. Life is a flat circle. Not actually true because Bungie didn't, Activision didn't necessarily own Bungie. There were things in place in that contract that would have, you know, resulted in those sorts of scenarios and, and, and everything there, but it, it's not quite the same. But yeah, if they had been with Activision, then they would have been, Kind of an independent company being published by Microsoft, I suppose, which would have been weird. Instead, they sold to Sony and they did that instead, I guess. Weird. Weird how that works. Um, David from York in the United Kingdom writes and it says, you've spoken eloquently in the past about how satisfying good sound effects can be in certain games and how that can, elo and how that can elevate the experience. It might be just a personal preference, but there's something deeply unsatisfying about the slightly dull electronic thwup noise in the new Modern Warfare 3 multiplayer when you kill an enemy player. It's still a useful audio cue that the other player is down, but it's not as satisfying as it has been in previous iterations. It could just be my general lack of enthusiasm for what this game is versus the price I paid influencing me, though. Would love to hear your thoughts. I agree. The thwup noise, the hit marker effect in Modern Warfare 3 is weirdly subdued. It's like it uh it it's like they turned a cutoff knob up a little bit and it just doesn't hit. I don't know if they still have uh, Modern Warfare 2, I believe, had it, but you could go change the hit marker noise from their Modern Warfare 2 one to the classic fucking meme run level hit marker sound effect I th that might still be in there they might still have those options in there so um or we could just go play meme run I suppose I'm gonna pull my Wii U out so we can play meme run uh Applodeon in, in the chat says epic achievement chime is very annoying the, you're right the, the noise when you get an achievement inside of a, an epic game is like hilarious as a, a, like I think Kotaku wrote an article about this and said Alan Wake 2 is fucking ridiculous because of this weird bring like the the weird happy little noise that the epic client makes whenever you get an achievement like something super grim is happening on screen and it's just, it's, it's like doing this very silly noise like the the steam achievement noise that they have now is very it's quick and, and whatever. Um, but yeah. Max from Kansas City writes in and says, In the past, you had made comments about Sony bringing back Killzone to now compete with Call of Duty and in such shooters after recent Microsoft acquisitions. Since Guerrilla Games is more oriented towards Horizon, my lizard brain thought a lot about the gameplay mechanics of Titanfall 2. While I'm not saying that Respawn should be given the chance to make a kill zone, I'm trying to spitball ideas about what a new kill zone would look like. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about this or any fun ideas. Well, I, you know, I don't think EA would lend out Respawn to make um, make a new kill zone. I don't think EA would be, EA would be down for that. Um, 
kill zone is a vibe kill zone is an aesthetic kill zone is uh the hell gas that's it if you want to make a new kill zone game it's because the hell gas look fucking evil as fuck they look like future nazis um and you want to murder them like like nazis in video like when you see nazis in video games you want to shoot them uh yes they're yes the or they can make a jinro game if you wanted to just go that route but um yes the hellgast the hellgast are the entire reason why you would make a new kill zone story mode because they look fucking crazy and you want to gun them down and so they have a fascinating enemy there in the hellgast um Everything else, I think, is um, negotiable. If you were to make a new kill zone, I think all you really have to do is it's got the Hellgast in it. Everything else about what is in it, you know, are we putting the fucking bird from that one kill zone in it? No. Is it a squad based game? Is it a this? Is it a that? Like, I think all of that is up for debate. I think the only thing that is a must have when you are making a kill zone is the Hellgast. Uh, the rest of it is just like, hey, make a great shooter. Um, I think on the multiplayer end, I like the mode that they did in Killzone where it would change modes over time. So you would do like one round of escorting a VIP and then one round of team deathmatch and then one round of domination. And so it was like all one match, but it was shifting modes as you went. That was cool. Um, I would, I think they should do that. I'm surprised that more games have not stolen that and tried to do a mode like that. Um, but I, those, that would be, those would, I think are, those would be the two things I think you have to have if you're making a new kill zone. I think that mode would be cool to have. You could do without it, but you know, Hey, they should bring it back. It was rad. Uh, and the hell gassed. The look of the hell gas, the glow of the eyes, all that stuff, shooting those fucking helmets off, crushing those motherfuckers. Like that's, that is kill zone. They don't need to pick up the story. They don't need to be like, whatever happened to Rico? Fuck Rico. Put him in the dirt. We did. We, we did. We, we did put him in the dirt. Um, and everything from there is just like make a really good sci-fi style, realistic, realistic future first person shooter cinematic big moments but then you know if they're making just that then they're just chasing call of duty which um doesn't seem to go well for people when they do that ask medal of honor um how that went last time they were making medal of honor games um but i i, I look at it as like yeah if you, that's those would be the key things i think you would want you would want a trailer that opens with those fucking eyes and then it fades up on the hell gas and they're doing something bad. And then you've got some ragtag group of maniacs that are going to infiltrate the hell gas and blow them up and blah, 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 you know, whatever it is, whatever your story is. Shadowfall was not a terrible game. It just wasn't, I don't know. It just didn't, it was not enough. It was not kill zone enough for me. <clears throat> It was like they wanted to have a kill zone game, but kind of wanted to have a weird Assassin's Creed ish sort of old, old Assassin's Creed ish sort of thing as well. Or you know, open world ish kind of. Not open world. I mean, you know what I mean? It's just like a. It's a weird thing. Um. Ryan writes in and says, I can't help but feel we've reached peak indie game. Don't get me wrong. The rise of small scale, truly independent games over the last two decades has been massively positive for the industry. But every time there's an indie game showcase, I feel like I'm seeing the same four or five games over and over. Life sim, visual novel, action roguelike, and sad story platformer, etc. What's worse, there's like three art styles that seem to dominate high def, 16-bit, low def polygons, and drawn by a talented but disturbed child. Am I being old and cynical, or is this a regression you're noticing too? What do you think caused this? 
I think that the games that are being represented in these indie showcases are not the full breadth of games coming out. I think that there is a much wider variety of games and genres and art styles being represented. But I think that when we go to like, what are the 18 games Nintendo is showing? And, and you end up with like, here's these four farming things or, you know, like you, I, I think that some of the games that are being uh, backed by the large capital I indie publishers, I think some of those games are starting to maybe pigeonhole themselves into the genres you're talking about. I mean, I've, I've certainly noted this year, it's like, man, what the hell happened? Why are all these farming games coming out? Um, but like, there's plenty of stuff that comes out that is under the radar. There's plenty of games that come out that don't get any press at all because they're just fucking, you know, uh, yeah, uh, Fat Scout brings up Pizza Tower. Pizza Tower is a great example of an indie game that looks phenomenal and, and has its own thing going on. It's, you know, it's definitely a love letter to a specific Nintendo franchise uh, along the way. Um, I think El Paso Elsewhere is a great example, uh, even though it does have kind of your low def polygon kind of thing going on. I think that it's got a killer soundtrack. I think the way it is evoking Max Payne is, is fascinating and makes it stand out, but I think it's a, just a good fun shooter on its own. Cocoon is a hell of a game. Um, Dave, the diver, everyone's favorite indie game. Um, no, I mean, what's, you know. Hey man, Hollow Cure is on Steam now. <laughs> hyper Hell, uh, which is a hyper pop tinged auto shoot, a uh, dual joystick shooter. That's free. That's on Steam. That's a fucking mess. Um, it fits into one of your categories for sure. Um, I'm just looking at stuff I have installed here. Like uh, you know, the last faith is coming out pretty soon. I don't know how much I can say about this. That's out tomorrow, in fact. I don't know how much I can say about that. Uh, is uh, yeah, the, is the Invincible? Is that tech, who published that? Eleven Bit Studios. The Invincible is technically an indie game as well, and that's got a much higher gloss to it than a lot of you know. Like I, I think that there is. Um, there is more variety out there and I think that, but I, but I do think that when we look at the showcases and we look at the games that are getting, um, getting that push, uh, when the booking agents are getting behind some of these indie games, when they're booking their showcases, uh, we're definitely seeing a, you know, yeah, I, I think you, you do start to, to see games that fall into, uh, some of the categories that we're talking about, right? I, I feel like that we're on the cusp of that having to go away too. We'll see. I mean, day of the devs is there. There's going to be a new day of the devs showcase, um, kind of alongside the game awards and we'll see what they have to show there. I know, uh, digital eclipse is showing their next gold master series game there. They're announcing it at day of the devs. So we'll see what that ends up being. That could be very exciting. I'm sorry. Atari is announcing their new gold master series game. Um, but yeah, you know, I think, uh, indie games are a business, you just, you know, like, like the, the indie publisher, I wonder how well some of those places are doing the devolvers of the world and stuff these days. Cause you know, it, yeah, the games that have been getting promoted and pushed and everything you do, like I said, we, we saw a lot of cozy games, farming sims and some of that stuff. Like there was just a lot of that all of a sudden, but I think it's more that there's kind of been a wave of that and it's just getting a spotlight on it that it maybe wasn't getting before. Um, but gosh, so many games are coming out all the time now. I mean, we haven't even dipped our toe into all the hardcore video game pornography that's being released on steam all the time now. Uh, there was evidence found of, uh, of a hide this game from my library, uh, button being added to steam to remove it from like the, the, your achievement lists and other public facing places that would show the games you own. 
which sounds to me like a good way for them to sell more porno video games. But, you know, there's, there's a lot of reasons. I have to use that once or twice a year because I'm playing an unreleased game and the publisher requests that you go like, like PlayStation has a thing where you can go toggle on a hide this game from my achievement list or my trophies list or, or whatever it is. And so when like when Spider-Man 2 came in, it came with like instructions on like, go in here, launch the game, quit the game, go in here, go into your privacy settings, turn this on, hide this. And, and you know, so that's, that's definitely a thing that happens um, on, on other platforms as well for non-pornographic reasons. Scott writes in, I just saw a commercial advertising a TV including the latest NBA game installed. Is this the beginning of the end for consoles or will sports games finally turn into annual updates? Um, neither. That's probably a streaming thing. I don't think they're just full on installing a console level uh, NBA game onto a television. But, uh, you know, Samsung has been getting continually aggressive with its like game streaming hub and everything. They're always at game events with the TV going like, look, you can stream games on our TV. Um, so I assume it's something like that, uh, that it's just like, Hey man, you can pair a controller to this television and you can do X cloud stuff on it or, or, you know, whatever other services they've partnered with. I can do this TV, this LG, I can download the GeForce now app on it and play PC games on it with a controller. Yeah, I guess it's Bluetooth. I'd actually, I don't think I've ever paired a controller to that TV. I don't know what I would do, but I assume it's a, I assume it's Bluetooth. I oh, mean, I have no idea. Um, Bluetooth. Sean Hogan. Right, in. I don't normally say last names, but it just rolled off the tongue. I'm sorry. <laughs> I won't say where you're from as a result. At the end of the day, do you think Soldier Boy Tellum was onto something with his opinion of Braid? <sighs> Soldier Boy is not wrong about Braid. Um, I Soldier Boy might not have the most nuanced take on Braid. Um, uh, but you know, I, I think he had a, a totally valid take on braid for sure. Are they, did I, am I fucking high, man? Am I drinking a jug of urine? Are they remaking braid? They're remaking braid, right? Yes. Yes. That was also announced last week. I forgot it. I would have included it. Otherwise video games. Chronicle says, Braid Anniversary Edition will be released on April 30th for PlayStation 5, 4, Xbox Series X and S, Xbox One, and PC. It will also be released on Netflix. Uh, Jonathan Blow's company, Thecla, is doing the work. It will feature hand-repainted graphics from the original artist. Uh, improved animations with extra frames for smoother motion. Improved audio, new mixes and variants of the soundtrack, and an extensive and detailed commentary track, which will contain over 15 hours of commentary from Jonathan Blow, as well as nine other contributors. Uh, according to this Video Games Chronicle story, rather than a straightforward audio track, the commentary will seemingly be interactive to an extent and will point out things on the screen, as demonstrated in the trailer. You can go follow particular threads of commentary spatially through wormholes that go from level to level, to see evolutions of particular concepts. Jonathan Blow said in a statement, the goal is to make it the craziest, most in-depth commentary ever put into a video game. The commentary has lots of markup so we can circle stuff on the screen, point arrows at whatever visual detail we're talking about, show diagrams, playback recordings, and many other capabilities. That sounds cool. I don't know that I am interested in playing more Braid. Um, but yes, that's, that's Braid is the game that made Jonathan Blow. That made Jonathan Blow, Jonathan Blow. Braid is a game that helped Xbox Live Arcade take off. Braid is the game that helped indie games and self-publishing. I, I think there, Braid was a very big game at the time of its release. It was, it came at a time that... 
a lot of downloadable games were having trouble getting respect on the level of other games and braid at the time was very 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 well regarded um and uh i don't know that it has aged super well i don't know that the story is necessarily something that has uh has aged incredibly well over the years but it was wildly successful it'll be interesting to see what they do with it and also you know at this point most people that would play this i would think would already know the interpretations of the story in braid and kind of where that stuff goes i think if if they don't get into that i don't know if he's ever gotten into like the specifics of here is what braid is about from me the person who made it i, I don't remember if he ever waded into any of that conversation um but there's definitely that moment when you reveal the true nature of braid that you're like uh okay it's a little that's that's fascinating that it has a level of depth to it um that's fascinating that it has a level of narrative depth depth to it and everything but also ah maybe this is a little ham-fisted now that we're now that we're really engaging with this material maybe this is actually a little yucky um And then you get to an even deeper level of it from there and you go, okay, so it's maybe just a little more ham fisted than it is gross. I don't, mm. anyway, braid mechanically was super fun. And, uh, you know, and, and it, the way that people got into those secrets and the way that people, I mean, you know, the people weren't necessarily having as many conversations about games like that as they, they do these days. So yeah, I guess you do have to perhaps give it to them for that. Uh, but whatever, I, you know, I, I'm not here to shit all over Braid. I actually, Braid was very cool in its day. Um, Braid was a landmark event for uh, indie games on console. Uh, and uh, it's it, it was it was a very big deal. I, I, I'll be curious to see a couple of things when this thing comes out in April. Like, people coming to Braid new for the first time after everything that came between Braid and right now, what will people think of it? And also people that played Braid then and playing it again and like, what, you know, hey, what's, what do we, what, what do we think about Braid all these years later? 15 years, in fact. Um... 15 years since fucking braid 15 years since soldier boy and the time rewinding potion and oh man time is weird and I guess we're out of time that's going to do it for this week's episode of the Jeff Gersman show I've been your host Jeff Gersman apparently discord makes sound effects apparently discord has notifications i thought i had all those turned off i don't know what the fuck happened there but oh it's because i'm set to invisible as opposed to do not disturb i would think that it's setting to invisible would imply that i would also want to not be disturbed but apparently not discord apparently not uh anyway that's going to do it for the show this week. Uh, I will come at you with some kind of stream at night this week. I'm not sure what. I, I feel like there's like there's big games that I haven't streamed, but also I don't know what, what I what I want to do next here. I kind of want to play some more RoboCop, but I don't know. We'll see. I haven't uh, played all of the Invincible, so maybe that'd be something worth looking at. Perhaps the Talos Principle too. I don't really know. The new character in Mortal Kombat 1 that I haven't looked at. Maybe that'd be a fun one. Anyway, that's my way of saying no Wednesday morning stream because I'll be off seeing my uh, my daughter's school play. And then uh, I'll be back on Friday. Uh, should be here in the morning at normal time, uh, barring any crazy stuff happening. But we're, we're working our way back towards some kind of regular schedule here. Um... And so we should be, uh, I should be here Friday morning to rate and rank some 8-bit Nintendo games. Someone put up a, I, I, I don't have the name in front of me, but um, you can now go to 
Uh, 8-bit Nintendo dot science. That's the number 8, not 8 spelled out. 8-bit Nintendo dot science, and they, they have put together a list of all of the games that have been ranked on this uh, ongoing series so far, as well as timestamps of where they are and, and all that sort of stuff. I guess it's pulling the data from a GitHub repo, which is very ridiculous. Very silly. Um, I'm very close to turning my uh, list into a spreadsheet so that it can have a few more data points than it has currently. But anyway. Um, that's going to do it. We'll be back uh, later this week. And then, of course, back on Friday with some 8-bit Nintendo games. I will talk to you soon. Until then, have a good one. Bye.